Hello and welcome to the Australian Roundtable Podcast. Today is Sunday, April 5, 2015. This is episode number 26 of our weekly broadcast. I'm your host, Jono, and I'm joined in the studio by Ethan Nash of TOTT News. Thanks for being here. Good to be here. And we are linked via Google Hangout to our resident wise old elder, the silver fox himself, Lindsay. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here as well. Well, we're pleased to have you. Now, the show continues to grow, so here is a quick blurb for the benefit of new listeners. The Australian Roundtable Podcast is a Brisbane-based independent news analysis discussion panel podcast which broadcasts live every Sunday from 3 p.m. standard time, I guess, now that Daylight Savings is finished. Listeners can take part in a live chat forum at the YouTube channel during broadcasts. All episodes are archived at the channel and are also available in MP3 format for you to download for free from our website, osroundtable.com. Views presented by individual panellists and guests are not necessarily representative of the entire panel and each presenter is solely responsible for his or her own comments and claims. All important information is uh, provided at our website, osroundtable.com, so you can verify and analyse it for yourself, which we always recommend you do. And episodes generally run for two hours and although it's a roundtable discussion, we do try to keep to a rough structure for each episode, generally breaking the show into a domestic and international segment. I'll get to today's rundown right now. We'll start off with a general chat, just like we always do, and we'll discuss... Australian families doping up their kids, Ethan. I'm looking forward to that. Then we'll get into the in, the uh, domestic rather segment proper where we'll talk about the following topics. Anti-Islam versus anti-racist protests across the country yesterday. Pensions and government theft thereof. Uh, fluoride in Queensland, an update on that one that Ethan's prepared for us. Western Australian opposition proposing to ban GMOs. National produce safety monitoring being disbanded multinational corporations rorting the Australian tax system, and finally, shopping hours in Queensland and who controls the shops and the lobby. Then international, we'll talk about the BBC and a 9-11, uh, rather a British court ruling regarding 9-11 and BBC, uh, Facebook controlling the flow of news, American millennials educated but unskilled, anti-Islam ads on Philadelphia buses, and if we get time, Drones being used to disperse crowds in India. So it's an action-packed show today, boys. Action-packed. Lots of things to discuss. We probably won't get through all of it. I'll throw to you first, Eric. How have you been, my good man? Uh, yeah, not too bad, Jono. Um, I think every week I, I'm sort of reawakening more of the inner passion that I had a couple of years ago. As we spoke off air, I've sort of fallen off over the last year and a half, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that... Uh, <clears throat> would tend to agree that to have, have seen my previous work before those dates, um, but I'm getting back into the swing of things and uh, glad to be here. You know, I've listened back to a few of our podcasts and it always takes me a few minutes to get rolling and uh, today I feel like I'm still just getting back into the swing of it. Of course, we've got the headphones in today and you have to listen to your own voice as you talk and it's a very concerning experience. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay, you're joining us via Google Hangout, mate. How have you been the last few days? Yeah, I know. I've been good, thanks. Yeah, my my youngest daughter came and visited me over the weekend for Easter, um, so it was nice to see her again. You know, so yeah, yeah, I'm feeling quite good about things. Do you have like a like an internal conflict? You want to be the nice grandpa who gives her chocolate eggs, but then you think the chocolate's doing her no good at all. How do you reconcile those things, Lindsay? Uh, I don't have a problem with that. Um, <laughs> I a, a lot of it I leave to the parents. They they've got to work out what they're going to do. Um, they're responsible for their kids. Um, as a grandparent, you've got to do something, and then you know, obviously, you'd be a negligent grandparent if you didn't give them some Easter eggs. Um, so I, I take the attitude: all right, it's not happening every day of the year. They're going to pig out for a, a one day on on Easter eggs, and then it'll be over with. Um, I think it's different if you're letting them pig out on chocolate every day of the year. That's a different matter altogether. But no, I don't see a big problem with with something like that. I know I'll I'll come into conflict with a lot of people who keep telling me that you know Easter's a, what Easter's about and it's not about Easter eggs and you know, and I understand that but that's just what's in our society at the moment you know your, your kids are going to be um, the ones left out if you if you don't give them Easter eggs okay back to well, you well I'll tell you well, we're up to 20 live listeners as we speak many of them are in the live chat I'm sure they'll discuss this as well Lindsay we like to have a little chat at the start of the show but we've got a lot to discuss we better get straight into it and the first thing we thought we'd talk about today is the fact that Australian families are doping up their kids now, I've got a few notes about this, so let me read an article to you from The Age from April 5, that's today. One in five families admits to using sedative drugs, including Finergan, on their children for a quieter life on road trips. Quote, one in five New South Wales families are doping their children with medication to keep them quiet on long road trips, a new national study of motorists has revealed. The driving survey, commissioned by insurer GIO, shone a light on the behaviour of 3,700 parents, including 600 within New South Wales, 
who embark on extended road journeys, while four in five families give youngsters handheld computer games, including iPads, and 70% keep treats up their sleeve, 18% of New South Wales drivers admit to tranquilizing their children with drugs that sedate, such as the antihistamine Finergan, to make the journey more comfortable. Uh, when all else fails to curb unruly behavior, 64% of parents nationally threatened to stop the car and leave the children behind. A further 56% said they had also cranked up the music to drown the children out, end quote. Now, that's just a few portions yeah. of this article, Lindsay. And since we're on the topic of how we treat our kids, I might as well throw to you first. Sir. What are your thoughts on this? Um, I'm, I, I'm, there are two things. I used to do a lot of traveling um, with the kids in the car when they were younger. So I, I, I sympathize with this. Um, I, it, it's very difficult to keep them entertained. Now, nowadays, of course, they've got television, they all sit and watch Frozen or something like that on the, the DVD screens behind the seat. Um, in the old days, it was a bit different. Um, so so it is, it's not an easy thing, and I know kids get bored very quickly on long trips. Um, I know there was one ad about, you know, are we there yet, Dad? Are we yet, there yet? You, you probably know the one I'm talking about. Um, but at the same time, I can remember babysitting the, the kids of, a fa of some people we knew were family, um, and they doped their kids up on this Finergan or whatever it was called. But I think when you give them too much, they actually go off the deep end. So instead of quietening them down for us, they just went absolutely off their face for the whole for the whole evening. Um, so I'm I'm really suspect about this this whole drugging business, and I'm not sure that it does them the world of good either. I don't I don't know what the the long term effects if you're doing it on a regular basis is. Anyway, I'll throw back to you on that. Yeah, it's very interesting, Lindsay. Um, obviously, I don't have children of my own uh, to sympathise or relate to um, long car rides or just looking after kids in general and uh, understand from my own personal experiences as a child that I didn't like long trips and whatnot, but uh, I still got through the long trips um, one way or another. I am completely against, and I saw this on... Um, the internet, there was a massive discussion about it the other day, talking about uh, the benefits and uh, the problems with having DVD players in the cars and what happened to I Spy and all of these games that, you know, the kids used to play and now the parents don't understand how to be parents by design. And uh, now this is just another step forward where they're actually just doping their kids to not have to deal with them. I think that's very concerning, Jono. Well, so si Obstacles in the live chat says, uh, oh, what, they get iPads and now they get drugs too. The kids are spoiled these days. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, look, Lindsay, you might not want to state publicly on a broadcast like this that you have uh, doped up your kids with Finergan, but I have heard of this uh, in, you know, in my personal life, this happening, giving kids Finergan so that they'll be more sedated so they'll go to sleep, whatever. It wouldn't surprise me if this 18% um, is heavily underreported, and it's actually much more than that. But if you're curious to know about what the effect of drugs might have, I'll take this from the article again. Quote, and this is re, uh, sorry, this is regarding Finergan. Quote, the drug is available over the counter and is commonly used in the treatment of allergies, but it also contains promethazine, a sedating antihistamine. According to patient information guides compiled by its various manufacturers, Finergan should not be used on children aged under two due to its potential for fatal respiratory depression. End quote. So it. It is a potentially dangerous drug, and one of the reasons why I found this one interesting is because remember a few months ago in Australia, there was a big incident where someone was treating their kid with epilepsy with cannabis oil, and that, that, that was uh, enough to get them potentially thrown in prison and have their kids taken off them for treating a genuine condition with a drug that can genuinely treat it. That's this huge problem. Mm. But we've got this over-the-counter drug that people are giving to their kids to shut them up on long-distance trips. Now, I know we've got lots of uh, adult, uh, we've got lots of parents listening to the show, and I'm here to judge anyone's parenting skills because I'm not a parent yet, and I feel like... Until you've done it, you don't really know how hard it is. I totally dig that. But it's the hypocrisy for me on a societal level, not, not an individual level, so please no one get offended here. On a societal level, we think it's okay to dope your kids up on a potentially fatal antihistamine, but treating your kids with cannabis oil, a, a magic uh, component from the earth, is enough to get your kids taken off your weight, and it's nonsense. I completely agree. And it's not just it's not just this with the cars. You know, now kids are being diagnosed with ADHD and all of these you know, s s provable you know, imaginary sort of... Um, you know, the conditions that they have and all of these these new made-up conditions over um, a long period of time where kids are just being doped up by the pharmaceutical industry on a regular basis. And we spoke about this on your, your Sunday sessions last week, I believe, when we had a, a massive talk about uh, um, the pharmaceutical industry in general, Jono. And uh, it just seems like this is something that is, is continuing on and it's not just in the car. It goes well beyond that, Jono. 
certainly does. And in a live chat, people are discussing ADHD, and someone has made the comment that uh, they thought everyone knew that ADHD was uh, largely exaggerated to push Ritalin. I've been meaning to do an article for a long time now on psychiatry and the pharmaceutical industry because it's a major scam, and maybe we can talk about that next week. But we do have to get into the domestic segment proper. And the first topic on today's agenda is the protest that took place yesterday across Australia. So what I'll do, Ethan, is I know you were there personally. We'll get your comment in a moment. I'll read out this quick article from The Age. I'll make a couple of points, then we'll throw to you. Now, this is from The Age down in Melbourne uh, from April 5 today. So this is Easter. Melbourne faces off at anti-Islam rally as police on horseback hold factions apart. Quote, Hundreds of people washed spit from their faces on Saturday evening after an ugly standoff at Federation Square between supporters of Reclaim Australia, an anti-Islamic movement, and No Room for Racism, a coalition of trade union, community, and left-wing groups. It's been reported that these were competing rallies. Those reports are wrong. What occurred at Federation Square was trench warfare, with police on horseback holding the armies apart. Because the police had been quick to isolate the core Reclaimer group on the forecourt of the SBS building, Hundreds of latecomers were left to mingle with the no rumours. Mingling often meant one-on-one -on -one screaming matches that occasionally broke out into pushing and shoving. Now and then a stray punch or two was thrown. Organiser Mel Gregson said no room for racism was formed with the express purpose of shutting down the 16 rallies across Australia planned by Reclaim Australia. The Reclaimers on their Facebook page described their mission as we as patriotic Australians need to stand together to stop halal tax, Sharia law and Islamisation. Between noon and 3 p.m., the Sunday Age witnessed a prolonged venting of frustrations, half-baked ideas, and outright hatred. In the end, it wasn't Muslims being hated, though. It was the white people from each side incensed by the position and taunting of the other. Two middle-aged women, both wrapped in the Australian flag, both insisting they weren't racists, just concerned, were assailed by a scrawny young woman who called them CUNTs at least a dozen times. In fact, the prevailing relentlessly megaphone message from the No Rumours to the Reclaimers was, F off. Sitting cheerily in the middle of the chaos, literally dancing in their seats, were Emily, 28, and Melissa, 32, from Brunswick. They'd brought an amplifier and iPod and were playing upbeat songs of togetherness, including the rumpy band's White Fella, Black Fella. Their placard read, We'd rather listen to our music than your racist comments. Said Melissa, We just want to live in a country that accepts diversity. End quote. Now, thanks for bearing with me, listeners. That's only a portion of the article. I read other parts that are most relevant to what I want to say, and I want to say these points. One... Notice that even Fairfax, the publisher of The Age, admit that this was whites protesting against whites. Muslims nowhere to be found. And this is exactly what our enemies want, divide and conquer. Point two, following from that, this further demonstrates my point that white people, at least in this country, are the ones who do the protesting. Little wonder then that the increasingly authoritarian governments are flooding us with Asians, Arabs and Africans. They're not the ones who do the protesting, we are. Point three, look through the photos and the video from those articles, that was just one, there are others, and you'll see telltale signs of our friends, the socialist alternative and their ilk. Also, the indigenous rights protesters, who we saw plenty of at G20 here in Brisbane, Ethan, a few months ago. So you've got your so-called anti-racists protesting alongside the sorts of indigenous rights protesters who we witnessed preaching to crowds that white people should be deported from the country. Those are the two groups who are protesting together. Mm -hmm. Anti-racists and people who want to deport all the white people. And finally, point four. As I keep saying, this incident is just another demonstration of the fact that anti-racist is just a code word for anti-white. And with that said, Ethan, I'll throw to you. Yeah, thanks, Jono. Um, I was there yesterday. I was at this rally when it happened uh, down at King George Square, and everything that you said there is completely true. That's exactly what happened. I didn't go to cover it because I knew it was just going to be a complete disaster. That I was invited to all the events, the uh, um, get rid of neo-Nazi scum titles from our from our society, and all of this that was happening. And you know, I've got I've got a lot of uh, acquaintances and and a couple friends in in both sides of this sort of uh, division that was happening yesterday. So you know what I mean. I'm, I'm not attacking them on an individual level, but this was just, you, know, you said it perfectly, divide and conquer. Um, Philip II and Macedon would be laughing that his, his, his tactics of divide and conquer have still, the simplest tactics have still survived and have gotten worse today here in, in, in Australia. And I was watching it and the, there was the purpose of the Reclaim Australia was against the extremist wings of Muslims, not against Muslims in general, but the majority of the people that made up that group 
were just protesting Muslims in general and were just, you know, actually, you know what I mean, sort of came off as, as legitimate um, racists towards Muslims, even though that wasn't their intended public goal. Um, so I, I, I saw that from that side thinking, you know, it, again, it's it's people that have been brainwashed into believing that Muslims are the enemy when it's it clearly not Muslims that are the enemy. And then on the other side was just the, the, the ridiculous counter where there, there was literally police, lines of police stopping people, and it, it was made up of indigenous people saying, it's not your land to reclaim in the first place, always was, always will be Aboriginal land, all of the same stuff we saw at the G20, uh, socialists that were there um, just doing what socialists do here in this state. You know, I'm, I'm sure you're very familiar with it, Jono. I, one speech, a guy was, he, he, was he, he had a flag and he was yelling out to the Reclaim Australia people being neo-Nazis and he was saying, what happens when your daughter gets raped at school um, and she comes home and tells you that and then you ask her, was it a Muslim or not? And then she says, no, it wasn't a Muslim, it was a white person, and you won't believe it because it's not a Muslim. And it was just the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And so these two groups, which have, have been convinced that each other are the enemy and both just have complete flaws in their arguments, they're arguing against each other, against police. And then, the, as you mentioned, there's these two on the side with a couple of other friends playing music, talking about how much you love cultural diversity. And this is all happening all over the country, just this madness that was happening. And I just sat back and said, I can't believe what I'm, I'm, I'm seeing here. It's not that I can't believe it. It's just that I thought that some of these individuals within these groups would have been smarter enough to do this. And I just said, at the end of the day, um, there's, there's people that want to express their right to freedom of speech, which I'll always defend even if I don't agree with them, and you're showing up to incite violence to, towards these people. Divide and conquer, you're completely missing the point here. Nobody that was there yesterday should be proud of themselves, John. Well, I wasn't there to witness what actually happened on the ground, and the article that I read out was specifically about Melbourne because Melbourne had more you know, so-called tussle and fussle than uh, what happened in Brisbane. But broadly speaking... Here's the way I see these two groups. You've got one group who've been convinced by the corporate media that Muslims are actually on an individual level the problem, they're potential terrorists, they're this, they're the other. They've been convinced that because this is what the corporate media is telling them. There's alternate, med genuine alternative media like us saying, well, actually, uh, we're being lied to about a lot of things, including ISIS for a start. That's all nonsense. You're looking at the wrong boogeyman. Then you've got this other group who are saying, no, 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 no. By protesting against Islam, you're somehow impeding on their rights. We're going to try and stop you from protesting which is fundamentally ridiculous. Now, I think all the hearts are in the right place. The protesters for Reclaim Australia, they genuinely believe that the Muslims who are here are the problem. I would say the Muslims who are here aren't the problem. The Muslims that the other side want to let in en masse are the problem. We just don't have the room for them. Focus on that issue. Don't focus on the Muslims who are here. Then I'd say to the group who are like, we're against racism. First, if you're really against racism, look at some of the people you're protesting against because it's clear that they're racist. They're overt and proud anti-whites. Now, if you're genuinely anti-racist, you should also be against the people who are anti-white. If you don't mind them being anti-white, then you're not really anti-racist, you're just anti-white. And that's fine. If you want to be anti-white, just be open and honest about it. Just admit that the people that you have a problem with are the white people who happen to be the majority in this country. Don't hide behind this veneer of being anti-racism because clearly you're not. And with that said, Lindsay, I want to throw to you then, mate. What are your thoughts on all of this? Yeah, well, I tend to agree with both of you. Um, I my, my understanding, like I get emails from, because of my age, I get emails from all these groups and I presume members of them are from this Reclaim Australia or whatever. Um, but w one of the things they were going on about was that there, there were very few foods that were um, not, hel they, they, they get a mark on halal or whatever. Um, and to do that, then money goes to certain groups. And I think there was some crook was put before court in, in Western Australia or maybe in Perth, ex um, over extorting halal money, um, so so I think that's part of what's motivating them. But, but having said that, there's also a, a Jewish um, kosher food mark that goes on food, so they'll be, they'll be getting collecting tax as well. So I can see the idea that we really don't want all these people being paid our tax money, you know, so that we our foods are being increased because people are getting money from us. Um, to, to give us permission to, to use their mark to say that they approve of that food. And a lot of it's cat food and God only knows what. So it's not really anything to do with halal or anything to do with kosher. Um, but having said that, no, I, I, t I do tend to agree with you. I think this whole thing has just gone over the top. 
and but we've talked about this before. This is um, our our Murdoch mates do this all the time. That's what they're there for. Try and divide the community, and you see it. You know, every day in the Courier Mail when I'm reading the Courier Mail, I see instances of this. And I'm sure during the day as we go through this, we'll see more of it as we we deal with the other topics. Okay, I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, and there's a natural human tendency for people to want to belong to uh, an opinion or an idea and label themselves that opinion or idea. So I'm sure that most people reading their Sunday newspaper this morning you know, in different publications would have instantly identified with one group or the other. One group saying, yep, definitely, uh, we should be protesting the, the Muslims. They're, they're this big problem, blah, blah, blah. There would have been a whole other group thinking, oh, we're much smarter. We, we identify with the ones who are trying to shut down the protests because we're against racism and blah, blah, blah. And I think uh, this is a classic issue where anyone who takes the time to really take a deep breath, think about what's really going on, can see that both sides probably mean well. They're both just heavily misguided. In the live chat right now, we're actually about 30 people watching live. There's a big discussion about race and is it real, is it important? And I think we probably have to do a big feature piece on this sometime in the near future, Ethan, because we have been talking about race a little bit the last couple of weeks and it has become, it looks like a bit of a touchy issue for a lot of people. And uh, my opinion, if I, can if I can explain it like this and we can go into further detail another time, is that uh, we treat our families better than we treat everybody else. We don't necessarily harm other people, but we just say, well, this is my family, I live with them, I've got more in common with them, they're the ones I'll treat better. If I have $100 to give away, I'm going to sooner give it to my family than to people down the street. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't mean that you mean any harm for the people down the street, but we generally treat our families better. And race, if you take the time to look into it, is just essentially like a big extended family. We are all related to white. If you're a white person, you are more related, even genetically, uh, to other white people than you are to other people who who hail from the other side of the planet. That's just fundamentally true. I don't know anyone who really tries to dispute that. Now, does that mean that you should treat them the way that you treat your family? Like that? Well, that's up to you. But this general idea that if people want to be around their own people, if they want to keep their neighborhood the way that it is with other people like themselves, I argue they should be allowed to. And I argue that about Japan. Japan have done this very successfully in this multicultural world. They've said, we are a certain way, we're a certain culture, a certain group of people. We want to keep it that way. You can come and travel to our country. If you fall in love with one of our people, you can even marry them. But you're probably never going to be Japanese. Your child can be, but you probably won't be because you're not from here. And I respect that. I've got plenty of respect for that. And if someone said, I'm going to flood Japan with white people, I'd say, why do you want to do that? What are you trying to get rid of there? Clearly the Japanese people. You want to flood it with blacks or Asians or white people? I say, why are you flooding them? Why can't they be their own group? Who are you to say what well, that, that bunch of islands can and can't be? And now that's the way I feel about Australia as well. Now, obviously, multiculturalism was setting here decades ago, and it's probably too late in many ways for the... Uh, white nationalists here to, to reclaim what was once a white country, people will say, oh, but it wasn't a white country the whole time. It used to be an indigenous country. And I would say, fair enough. How do you feel about the fact that whites came and flooded the indigenous country? You don't like it, do you? So how come you then like it when it's being done to whites? Are you an anti-white? Clearly they are. Now, this whole topic deserves far more attention than we can give it today, Ethan, and I promise in coming weeks we, so we soon will. But to me, this is a fundamentally important topic. I saw in the live comments last week, it was an important topic to a lot of people. And guess what? You can't talk about this anywhere in Australia anymore. In fact, if you try and have a protest about it, counter-protest has come along, and the mainstream media wraps up to be a big fight. So if we can talk about it on this show, we will. I promise that we will. It deserves more time. Lindsay, I want to give you one final thought, and then I'll move on to the next topic. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with what you just said. Um, and the, the, the point you're making is very true. Just because you love your family, you don't hate everybody else's family. And just because you love your own people doesn't mean you hate everybody else who's not one of your people. And, and it's the same thing with the race. It's just, yeah, it's, it's just a false, um, I'm trying to think how, they, they, they're creating a false dichotomy between us. And, and they're making out as if you're something that you are not. That I, I, it's infuriated me for a long time um, that, that, that they do this. Now, one little addition to that, we were talking about it last week, and I mentioned this, this woman, and you... you this Jewish woman telling the Europeans they weren't going to be allowed to remain as a monoculture. And I, it infuriated me that somebody would be that arrogant. Now, you, you mentioned her name, and I think you said you were going to put the, the, um, the, the YouTube link um, on, on our website, because that'll give you some idea of what the driving force is behind this. It's, it's very clear what's going on. The woman you um, refer to there, Lindsay, is Barbara Spector, and maybe in Sunday sessions I will play that clip and we can have a big open discussion about it. Of course, on Sunday sessions, everyone's welcome to come and have a chat. So if you're passionate about this topic, let's spend an hour or two this evening over a uh, glass of red wine and we'll chat about this topic. Uh, we'll give people a chance to chat and I'll play the clip from Barbara Spector where she states openly that she and other Jews will fill Europe with non-white people and they'll be resented, but they'll do it anyway. Those are her words, not mine. We do have to move on. Uh, Silver Slave 333 in the live chat says that he thinks these protests 
are just a setup and they're not real. And what's funny about that is if you look at the photos, they use fisheye lenses and they take close-up photos to make it seem like there's more people involved than there really are. And it's so obvious when you know what you're looking for. I don't think the protest was set up. I mean, certain individuals have reasons for wanting the protest to go ahead. I think they did go ahead. What I would argue, Silver Slave, where you and I agree is that it's not, it wasn't as big a deal as the media is making out. There's a bigger agenda there, and we will talk about that on Sunday sessions. But we do have to move on to the next topic. Uh, topic number two today is pensions and government theft. Lindsay, I'll let you take that one away. Yes, thank you. Um, these summarised passages that I'm going to read out now um, were taken from a document that was sent to me and it was issued by Veteran Web Network um, and that's a veterans association. Um, I'm presenting it as it is in accord with information that my father told me a long, long time ago when I was younger. Um, m my father had worked, he spent his virtually his whole working life with the ATO and I believe that what he spoke to me would be the truth because he was pretty smart about these sort of things. Um, so I'll, I'll start by, by quoting this document I got from the Veterans Web. Quote, Labor Prime Minister Ben Shifley introduced three bills to establish the National Welfare Fund to be financed by a compulsory contribution in brackets levy of one and sixpence in the pound. Now that's, a pound was, um, about two dollars for those you know who will uh, come afterwards, um, and it was on all personal income. So it works out at about fifteen cents in every two dollars they were being taxed. The opposition leader Robert Menzies stated that the compulsory contribution levy should be kept completely separate, that it should be shown separately on the taxation assessment um, form, and paid straight into a trust. Now remember that a trust account and not mixed with the general revenue. Now Menzies said the stigma of charity should be removed from the age pension. It should be an entitlement earned by the person's personal contribution to the fund. Now Prime Minister Sh uh, Chifley agreed and established the National Welfare Fund as at the 1st of the 1st of 1946. That was even before my time. A trust fund with the parliament as trustee. It was shown separately on the personal uh, tax assessment form for 1946, 1947, 1948, 1949 and 1950 and the compulsory levy was properly paid straight into the special trust fund and welfare claims were paid out of the fund. In 1949, the compulsory contributions levy was then grouped with the taxation assessment and appeared as one amount on the taxation assessment. So when you got your, your assessment came back um, after you put your tax return in, um, it, it appeared as one amount that, that was paid um, and, and it went straight into consolidated revenue account instead of part of it going into the trust fund. Now what my question is, where is this money, these self-funded contributors paid as a percentage of their total income tax collections? They are today worth far more than the amount of means tested pensions paid out. The tax is still collected to provide for the supply and con continuation of the old age pension. A stipend to the elderly citizens of this country who have worked for decades of their lives to build a nation and have from working day one of their lives been paying 7% plus of their taxes directly to this pension. Now, I don't know whether that's made it as clear as I was hoped it to be, but 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 basically, we keep getting this whole thing all the time that the pension is a a, a grant that we you know it's like a benevolent thing we're paying to you out of the the central uh, consolidated revenue account, um, and you know it's not going to be enough. They keep telling us there won't be a pension. You know by the time people who are 20 or 30 now uh, reach retirement age, there's just not enough money, um, and no no. You've been paying it, I've been paying it, even today we are still paying 7% of your tax is supposed to be going to consolidate, uh, sorry, to the, to the pension trust for your pension. It's no different to the superannuation that you require to, to contribute to, except with them they've got private people administering and taking out administration funds. So it's, it, I think people have to understand that this is going on and I, to me, when you're dealing with trusts, a trustee who steals the funds 
it's a criminal offence. And I'd like to know just where this parliament, all these parliamentarians, got off taking over this trust fund. It should have been kept separate. And I'd, I'd like the young who are listening to us to take this into consideration and perhaps ask their local member of parliament about this. I think it's about time this became very widespread throughout the community so everybody knows where we stand and they know what these politicians have done to us. Okay, I'll throw it back to you. Well, Lindsay, you've got a couple of points to make there, mate. First point is that last week you did a piece on the theft of superannuation because, of course, there's the pension and then there's superannuation. Superannuation is one that you literally put your money into by force of law. They take a portion of your money and set it aside in theory for you. And you were mentioning the fact that there are now discussions about adding extra taxes onto the superannuation because that's what they're doing to try and come up with a, an answer to their budget crisis, which leads on to my next point with the pension. This is something that all people were putting money into in theory to get in their retirement. Now our country is in so far in debt, I'll talk more about this later, so far in debt that we're paying literally a billion dollars a month in interest payments on the national debt. I mean, so much debt they say they can't afford to keep paying the pension. The only solution is because of this so-called aging population to flood us with lots more immigrants. So you see, Lindsay, how this all ties in. They're saying, yeah, you did pay your taxes, you did earn a pension for all of your life, but um, it's all gone, we're in debt, and the only solution is to make it so that your kids and grandkids are now competing with hundreds of thousands of people here flooding into the country to buy houses, and uh, that's how it's just going to be. Ethan, I'll throw to you. Yeah, I completely agree. You made some, both of you made some good points, and and the, and the real issue is it doesn't have to be like this. It doesn't have to be like this. We don't have to be in a budget deficit. This was all by design. Everything has happened by design to end up like this, so it benefits the people that uh, are, are serving these agendas and the agendas behind. Um, the, the the puppets that they do have there. This was all by design. It didn't. It doesn't have to be like this. We, you know, the, the, I always refer to the United Nations said it only costs just over thirty six billion dollars to solve world hunger, and the United States military spends more on that in a single month. This is by design. Everything's by design. So when you talk about superannuation, when you talk about pensions, how they keep raising the pension age, and Joe Hockey said that we're going to live to one hundred and fifty years old now in the future generations. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's almost like they're laughing in our face because they've done this by design and the people don't understand that they are being, uh, that, that, that they're being controlled like this. And I think Lindsay made a good point is that we do have to go to our local MPs and we do have to, have to voice our opinions to this and, and spread the word about it, John. Yeah, and Enchanted Wanderer in the live chat says, excellent stuff, Lindsay. There are a lot of people who want us to talk more about these topics because they do affect so many people right now. And of course, Ethan, we're young right now. We won't always be young. This will eventually affect us. In other words, this affects every person living in this country today, and not just them, but their kids and their grandkids. Very important topic, and it's a very simple one. Your money that they take, what do you get for it in the future? And it's like I always say, read George Orwell's book, Animal Farm. The classic story of the mayor works hard every day, works too hard because it believes in what it's working for. It really believes it. Then it gets too old to work anymore. It was promised a paddock. What happens? It goes to a knackery. And it's a perfect allegory of what happens today. I know so many people, I mean, even my own father, you know, he worked hard. He really believed that he was working for something important. He really believed it's important to work hard, maybe even work too hard to help the nation. Then what happens when they get to old and middle age? They get stooged. And it, ha it just, it, it, uh, it, <laughs> It's hard for me to talk about. It's so sad to see people who were, who were sold a lie and then they only find out when it's too late that it's one gigantic lie. And I guess that's one of the reasons why we try and do this show is to let other people see this whole system is sold on a huge lie. And Enchanted Wanderer asks a question, and it's a bit tangential, but I'll address it now. She says, if there were a referendum to have a caretaker government for 12 months to give us time to sort this mess out, would you vote yes? Well, if I thought that the people who were in charge of the caretaker government and sorting out the mess were legitimate, of course I'd vote for that. But when would the people in power ever give us an even chance to fix things up? It's like they say, never give a sucker an even break. Uh, the people who are in control right now, they're not going to give that up quietly and probably not over something as simple as a ballot. Lindsay, I'll throw to you. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I don't trust these people at all. I'm quite sure that most of our um, financial problems would be solved with two things. If they stop spending huge amounts of money on all these committees and things for political correct bullshit that they go on with, and secondly, that they made multinationals pay their fair share of the tax system. Instead of, I mean, we've had it in the past where even a very rich Australians were, were 
trading in the, the Caribbean islands or whatever, so they didn't have to pay their tax. Well, we interview. Pay... I hate to interrupt you there, my good man, but I promise topic number six of the domestic serving today, I'll be talking about exactly that topic. And I tell you what, oh. we do need to try and move on quickly because we've got so much to talk about today. We might as well leave that um, discussion there. I would throw yeah. you if you find a fourth there, Lindsay, but we know how that always turns out. So we'll get straight to the third topic today, <laughs> Ethan, and I know you want to talk about fluoride here in Queensland. Yeah, thanks, Jono. Um, this was some news that came out Friday the 13th of March. So it was uh, a long while ago, actually, but I only just discovered it this morning, and there was updates. It's, it was an updated article. The original article came from the start of March, and uh, I don't think that we talk, we spoke about it on the show when it originally came out, and that was uh, uh, Queensland Health Minister Cameron Dick has ruled out mandatory fluoridation of the state's water supplies. We spoke previously about water and fluoride here, what happens when Campbell Newman um, is, is booted out of Parliament, is there suspicion, I think Lindsay raised, that they're going to introduce mandatory fluoridation again, which uh, was reversed in, in 2011 or 2012, I can't remember the exact date, uh, when uh, uh, Springboard came out and, and, and said that, and I wrote, I wrote an article about it at the time, um, which meant that it went back to the councils, the individual councils had the decisions of what to um, put in their water via the, the the voices of the people, and and a lot, I think, twelve or so committees have, uh, twelve or so councils rather have gotten rid of fluoridated water here in Queensland. But um, but now, uh, yeah, I'll just read out a portion from this ABC article. Um, Labor supports fluoridation of drinking water as a preventative oral health strategy, a spokesman for Mr. Dick told the ABC. We will pursue collaborative strategies between the Department of Health, the Department of Natural Resources and Mines, and local councils to ensure the widest possible coverage of fluoride in Queensland communities. As opposition leader uh, Palaget criticised the LNP for dumping mandatory fluoridation, so that's that those were the uh, stepping stones that made us question whether or not they're going to introduce this because Palaget uh, uh, criticised it. And now uh, it has come out in this ABC article, which I will link to at ozroundtable.com, um, coming out saying that uh, mandatory fluoridation will not be reintroduced, which is a very, very positive thing here in this state. And I just thought I'd mention it really quickly, just as a real quick thing that we threw in there, just because it's great to have some positive news finally. Um, that uh, mandatory fluoridation won't be coming back in, John. It might have been episode 20 or 22 where you and Lindsay went into great detail about the many reasons why people should be concerned about fluoride. And I was happy to sit back and listen because what you spoke about was obvious, it was common sense, it was things that anyone can check for themselves. And we're trained to believe that fluoride is good for us and anyone who says otherwise is a crazy conspiracy theorist. And I see this as one of those topics where if you can wake someone up to the problems with fluoride, it might make them reconsider their worldview where they trust what they've been told by school and TV and how they've been told not to trust the people who question authority because if they do their own research, they'll see that we're right, the TV and the school system are wrong. Lindsay, what say you? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree entirely with what you've just said. Um, it's, it, we get back to this thing. If you open the, the door just a little bit and they get a glimpse, not everybody, but most people can't go back. They can't go back to being stupid again. Um, and so I think it's a good thing. Uh, the second part of, uh, point I'd like to make about the fluoride is that this, when when Campbell Newman, I mean a lot of people dump on him, but when Campbell Newman um, opened this up so that it could be up to the individual councils to decide whether they wanted fluoride, it, it gave a lot of heart to those of us who were against fluoride. Um, it sort of, it, it picked up the, the tempo. You know, we, instead of being knocked down for years on year on year, we, we suddenly thought, all oh, right, there's a chance that we, we will have our own freedom here, to, to freedom of choice. Um, so, and, and I think this that you've just spoken about, Ethan, is, is going to be another boost to, to our um, opt optimism or whatever. So we, we, it'll, it'll give us more strength to get up and keep going and keep going with the fight. So I'm very pleased to hear that news. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree, Lindsay, and that's why I thought, you know, I'd, I'd bring it up. And, and the reason that uh, mandatory fluoridation was abolished here in Queensland when it was introduced in 2008, discussions from 2007 by the Bly government, um, a lot of um, prominent protesters here in this state did some phenomenal work to try and get this to not be mandatory and now are doing phenomenal work to try and get it out of uh, the 
out of, out of their individual councils. Enchanted Wanderer in the live chat said that they're putting together a referendum for that here in Queensland, and I know of similar work from a lot of uh, fantastic activists out there here in this state uh, that have been really pushing for, uh, to have fluoridation uh, abolished completely from this state. So as you're, you, you hit the nail right on the head there, Lindsay, once again, this is just another uh, step forward for us, but then the, how long can you trust a government for? That's a good, you, John. Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, the point that I always make is if you really believe that fluoride is good for you, uh, you can drink it. Put it in your own water. It's not hard to buy stuff to put into your own water. If you think it's good for you and your kids, do it. I'm not going to try and stop you. My issue is where you try and force it upon all of us, and that's what we're doing. And how many people have actually spent even 30 minutes sitting down doing independent research to make up their own mind. The vast majority of people don't because if they did, they quickly see, oh my God, we shouldn't be doing this. So what we've got right now is mass fluoridation of a whole bunch of people who for the most part have no idea about the potential uh, health consequences of it. They just go along with it and why? Because that's what most people do. They've been trained to go along with it. You can go back to Stanley Kubrick's uh, 1964 film, um, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, you know, Dr. Strangelove. And in that, there's a guy who loses his mind, wants to nuke the world, and what does he believe in? Fluoridation being bad for you. So they've been trying to program us for 50 years now to believe not just that fluoride is good for us, but anyone who questions that must be crazy. And I'm, it's pleasing to see, and I'm glad you update us on this regularly, I'm pleased to see that so many people are starting to wake up to the outright lies that are involved in that. We do have to move on to the next topic. It's kind of related, actually, Ethan. This one's yours as well. Topic four is to do with the Western Australian opposition proposing to ban GMOs. Yeah, thanks, Jono. Um, I... I I put these articles together just because um, I thought that they related to each other because they're both uh, positive news pieces that have come out uh, that this week, obviously the update with the water fluoridation, uh, which I will just end on a final note saying that uh, uh, Greg Williams, I believe, in the chat at the start of the show said, check out Firewater, Australia's industrial fluoridation disgrace. It's fantastic. A documentary about fluoride here in Australia if you want to check that out for more information and obviously we'll have a feature piece in the future about fluoridation properly. But moving on to this, it's another piece of positive news uh, again by the ABC uh, that came out on Monday. It's uh, the Labor Party in Western Australia says that the state would transition to a genetically modified free zone if it wins government at the next state election. So two years out from the na next state election, this is reading from the article, in Western Australia, the Labor Party have revealed that the state would become a genetically modified free zone if it won government. GM crops are banned in WA. However, there are two exemptions, GM canola and GM cotton. Obviously, we spoke last week on the show about canola, about the trial of Steve March, which is happening right now in the Supreme Court of Western Australia, where his, his organic farm was uh, overcome by these genetically modified canola plants and uh, he lost his certification of organic uh, growing and farming because of that and, 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 and it destroyed his, his, his livelihood because of that and now he's trying to challenge that in the court at the moment. But farmers have been growing GM, and canola, GM canola in Western Australia since 2010. Darren West is a farmer and Labor Party member for the agriculture region. He said under Labor, WA would be GM free, quote, I think we'd have to sit down with industry and work out a transition away from growing those genetically modified crops, he said. About 1,000 farmers have taken up the option of growing GM, I'm told. The take-up has, hasn't been that great. There are 4,700 grain growers in Western Australia, of which the vast majority have cho not chosen to take up GM crops, end quote. And that's the end of the article. It's only a short one, which I'll link to at our website, ozroundtable.com. Um, but uh, another piece of positive news, and, uh, and, and it's good to see that this may have been a result of uh, the ongoing campaigns over in Western Australia about GM crops. We have Monsanto influence all throughout this country about genetically modified organisms, and, and I definitely will have a feature piece as soon as possible, maybe in the next two weeks, just going through genetically modified organisms as a whole and then their influence here in Australia, which you know I've covered for vastly for a lot of years. But this... Again, this is a very piece of positive news, similar to the fluoride one, but uh, again, it's in the government's hands and uh, there's not much to trust. But Lindsay, I'll throw that one over to you. Just on the overall uh, overall um, stepping stones of Western Australia becoming a genetically modified free state, what are your thoughts, mate? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit cynical about it because I think Monsanto has too much pull with too many organizations and political organizations in Australia. I, you know, it sounds good in theory, but I'm, I'll hold back any enthusiasm until I see what the outcome will be. I, I really don't trust, you know, Mon Monsanto are pretty big boys. I really don't trust 
that they that they will let this go. I think they'll work behind the scenes to get what they want. So so I'd, I'll just wait and see. I'll I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, I completely agree, Lindsay. Um, as as I mentioned last week, uh, the World Health Organization even criticised Monsanto themselves for having uh, for having uh, ingredients within their crops that cause cancer, and it have been proven on on numerous studies. But now that even the World Health Organization is saying it, and Monsanto are trying to make them retract that. That's how powerful this corporation is. Um, so again, you've got to be cautious, but. Uh, it's good to finally have a week where you can throw in little pieces of positive news where we do have some sort of positivity and outlook to come from John Owen. All you can have in this movement and in this world at the moment is hope and uh, you know to continue on doing this. So I'll throw it to you, your overall thoughts on this. Take away a man's hope and what's he got left? Uh, you make a very good point. We are very short of time. but so much to talk about this episode. So I'm happy to leave the GMO conversation to you and Lindsay. I look forward to your feature piece coming in the future. We might as well move on to your final piece of the three, uh, and this is the fifth topic for domestic, and this is National Produce Safety Monitoring Bureau apparently being disbanded. Yeah, thanks, John. Again, another article by the ABC I was going to cover over the last couple of weeks. We didn't have time. Um, I'll just make this real brief, and this is just reinforcing the notion that you can't trust the government, even though these positive news articles have come out. A safety net for monitoring chemicals in Australia's domestic food has been axed by the federal government, the ABC has discovered. Government reports have identified significant gaps and deficiencies in Australia's agricultural chemical residue produce monitoring as testing varies in each state and territory. The Labor government established a $25 million five-year pilot in 2013 for a national produce monitoring system which aimed to give consumers confidence and act as a vital safeguard. The system was scrapped in finer detail of last year's budget. Again, back to the budget. It was $25 million we were prepared to spend on what I think was a program of great merit, Labor's agricultural spokesperson Joel Fitzgibbon said. We are living in an environment where there is no bigger issue than food safety, and I think the government has some questions to answer. And I'll leave the article there because we are short for time, but uh, just this notion that even though we, we do... Uh, we are fighting for some sort of food safety and genetically modified free and, and, and you know the, the fundamentals of our health is food itself. Just this notion, Lindsay, that um, even if all of this comes to fruition, again, you can't trust the government because now they've even axed the produce monitoring system that regulates some of these chemicals that are used, Lindsay. I'll throw it to you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, yeah no, I, I agree with you. Uh, well, you know how cynical I am. I don't trust anything they do. And I and I I've just know from long experience that they are so susceptible to influence by outside forces. I know at one stage the Liberal Party were on the verge of bankruptcy and going to lose their building because a bank was leaning on them. Um, you know they 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 are so susceptible to being leaned on by big money. So so yeah, I don't trust anything they do or say. Now I think it's very sad because you know we've just had this berry thing from China. There's so much that needs to be probably they probably need to spend a lot more money to to guarantee food safety in Australia. But, you know, I'd, I wouldn't hold my breath waiting for it. Okay, throw it back to you. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Lindsay. And uh, as always, I'll leave links at osroundtable.com so people can uh, can can go research and, and, and look into it for themselves on a greater level. Uh, we are short for time, but I just wanted to throw those out there because I thought they were very important news items I found this week. And I'll throw it back to you, Jonathan. Yeah, it's a good point, and food is fundamentally important to us as people, and it amazes me how much money people spend on medicine, both uh, orthodox and uh, natural, when the best medicine is good food. It's that simple. If you are putting good food into your body, if you're getting basic exercise, sleeping properly, trying to avoid, relatively speaking, some of the toxins like alcohol and other drugs, if you're taking care of yourself, you won't need the medical industry anywhere near as much as we apparently do. And food is fundamentally important. And next time you're at your doctors, I recommend this to listeners. Next time you're at your doctors, ask them if you get a chance. How much time during your six or seven years at university did you spend dealing with nutrition? Just ask them, find out their answer, and then have a real long think about what's really going on with the medical industry. We do have to press on, so we'll get on to the next topic for today. And this is uh, topic six of domestic multinational companies rorting the Australian tax system. Now I've been promising to spend more time covering the Australian economy, and I will in the near future, but there's so much to cover that I'm considering doing a midweek spin-off show, to be honest, okay. and uh, I'll talk more about that later. In the meantime, I thought I would briefly cover an issue which has been getting more attention in the corporate media lately, and that is multinational corporations avoiding tax via legal methods. 
Now, there are two articles that I want to read to give some background. They're a little bit lengthy, so please bear with me. The first one's from The Age down in Melbourne. It's entitled, Energy Company's $11 billion transfer to Singapore rings tax avoidance alarm bells, April 4, 2015. Quote, an energy company operating in Australia transferred more than $11 billion to the low-tax jurisdiction of Singapore in a single year, heightening concerns that Australia is being duped by tax-minimising multinationals. The extraordinary scale of funds being moved out of the country by individual companies is revealed in an internal Australian tax office memo obtained under Freedom of Information. It lists 10 companies that channeled a combined $31.4 billion from Australia to Singapore in the 2011-12 financial year. An estimated $60 billion in so-called related parties transactions went from Australia to tax havens in the same year. Tax Commissioner Chris Jordan and a member of his senior colleagues have recently flagged concerns about cross-border transfers and intra-company refinancing and the potential that they are linked to tax avoidance. The tax office is particularly concerned about mining and energy companies extracting Australian minerals which have established marketing hubs in Singapore that appear to have little use other than as a destination for shifted profits. An ATO spokeswoman said the issue was currently under investigation. I can confirm that we currently have 15 audits of marketing hubs underway with more ready to go, she said. Treasury Joe Hockey is considering the introduction of a so-called Google tax, but some experts fear the problem of tax avoidance and aggressive minimization runs far deeper than the tech sector. Fairfax Media revealed this week that the 900 biggest companies in Australia reduced their tax bills by a combined $25 billion via deductions, exemptions, and other concessions. And quote. Now, that's just a portion of the article. Again, we'll link to everything on osroundtable.com so people can read for themselves and make up their own minds. But here's what you take away from that article. The 900 largest companies in Australia avoided paying a combined $25 billion in tax in one year, and one company in particular moved $11 billion of its gross income offshore to avoid paying tax on it. And most, if not all of this, was completely legal, with inverted commas. I'll explain more on that in a moment. Now, there's a Senate committee looking into these matters with some big names to give statements next week. So I'll read one more article, and then we'll get into a bigger discussion. This is from The Guardian. It's entitled, Multinationals are avoiding billions in tax, and the coalition has no clear solution, April 3, 2015. Quote, big companies and multinationals spend millions to avoid billions in tax by staying just on the right side of the grey line between legal tax minimisation and illegal avoidance. But next week, a Senate committee will be told Australia could reap billions back in extra tax revenue by changing who gets to draw that line. And instead of being drawn by the tax office in consultation with the big corporate taxpayers and their highly paid advisors, it should be a decision of Parliament, the elected representatives who were supposed to be the final arbiters of tax law, but who are now being left in the dark. The person proposing this radical idea will be Martin Locke, until last year, a profit-shifting practice advisor and non-resident withholding tax risk manager with the tax office, a very long title which basically means his work was all about drawing the grey line. In a confronting submission to the Senate inquiry into corporate tax avoidance, Locke describes a system under which the tax office is outgunned and overwhelmed and the highly paid experts advising the major corporations thrive, and that was before he and several hundred other technical experts on big business taxation left as a public service took job cut hit. He says the situation is so serious, he proposes that it be investigated by a royal commission. The grayness of the law hugely advantages the big corporations, he says, and providing a large company or multinational has crossed the line is usually very difficult for the ATO to prove. In only a handful of court cases has it succeeded. Executives from Google, Microsoft, Apple, News Corp Australia, Rio Tinto, Fortescue Metals, BHP Building and Glencore are also going to give evidence, along with corporate tax experts from PricewaterhouseCoopers, Ernst & Young and KPMG. The basic message from the corporate submissions is also that the tax system is travelling well. End quote. <laughs> Thank you again, listeners, for bearing with me there. Again, all articles we link to at osrantable.com. Now, uh, for those unaware, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Ernst & Young and KPMG are three of the big four auditing firms in the world. They each have more than 160,000 employees around the world, and they each have yearly revenues of around 25 to $30 billion per annum. These are the firms who assist large companies to engage in tax minimization, which is completely legal. And our universities in Australia are churning out graduates who not only believe this is a good thing, but cram hard for good exam marks to hopefully get into graduate programs at one of these firms to take part in these kinds of practices. And the logic is that they'll either stay with the firm long enough to make some good cash for themselves, or they'll stay with the firm long enough so that it looks good on their CV. 
Now, there's a whole number of things to be said about all of this. I could do a two-hour show on my own and barely scratch the surface. But here's a couple of points. The first one is, Mr. Locke is calling for a royal commission into tax avoidance, and I fully support this notion, and I believe that if enough Australians began making noises about it, it might even be possible to get one appointed. But I suspect it would require a huge amount of public complaint about the current system because the big end of town have no interest in such an inquiry taking place. Since they came to power in 2013, the Abbott Federal Government have appointed two royal commissions, one into the Home Insulation Program and one into Trade Union Governance and Corruption. Now, given that the federal government is currently $40 billion in deficit, that is for each year, $40 billion of new debt has to be taken out, and given that we're paying $1 billion per month in interest on the existing debt, which is only getting worse, and given that we're only going further into debt, and given that there is now talk about further raising all kinds of taxes and cutting social services to reduce the structural deficit the country is in, it seems obvious that a royal commission into tax avoidance is of greater significance than the two already appointed combined. Now, a lot of our listeners are fully aware that the current debt-based international financial controlled monetary system is an unnecessary, debilitating and fundamentally evil system which we could, with the right leaders, dispose of almost overnight and the nation and its people would be infinitely wealthier and better off for it now and into the future. We all know that. But let's for now go along with the prevailing paradigm, the one that's taught at universities across the country that this nation needs to borrow and make believe money from international finances and pay interest on it. It stands to reason, even for people who believe this nonsense, that we ought to minimize the amount we borrow, and one way to do that is to ensure that all companies pay their fair share of tax. Clearly, they're not doing so at the moment. Now, the average person on about $60,000 a year is paying more than 10 grand in income tax plus Medicare levy before they even see a cent of their labor. Then they pay GST on almost everything, alcohol excises, fuel excises, the list goes on. And due to the federal government policy of flooding us with 200,000 new immigrants every year, people are paying exorbitant amounts for housing, which is a basic cost of living. So how much does the average person have to show for their labor? Then compare what they get to what these multinational corporations who use tax avoidance strategies get, within the law for the most part, while the nation sinks further into debt. Australians should be outraged, and if enough of them start acting like it, perhaps we might see some pressure put on the puppet leaders to call for a royal commission. That will be a big first step in helping the peasants see who is really the nobility in this feudal system. Lindsay, I'll throw to you. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm, I don't necessarily disagree with you on the Royal Commission, but I don't think it's going to go anywhere either because we were talking about this same subject 20 years ago. People were bringing up policies then saying, look, get away, get away from all this income tax and, and have a tax, a very minimal one, like one cent in the dollar or something like that on all the money that goes in and out of bank accounts so that you'd catch all these big businesses because their, their income has to go into the bank account to be able to go across to Singapore or wherever they're going. So, so they're all, they're, there are heaps of alternatives. I'd, I'd have to go back through my computer and just see if I can find some of these things from 20 years ago. But I think you'll, you'll be astounded that this has been going on for that long and the powers that be don't want to change because I think they're being leaned on by people who are too heavy for them um, nobody wants to, to take a bullet in the head like um, like um, JFK um, or go swimming like, um, what was the, the fellow down in Victoria off the coast, um, Rex Prime Minister. Yeah, no, nobody wants to take that and I think that's hanging over a lot of these people. If you, get, if you start interfering with our profits, you could go for a swim or you could chew on a bullet and, and I think that's, we're talking about big banks, big business, we've discussed this in the past. It all goes up to a, in, the, in the shape of a pyramid to just a handful of people who own the whole damn lot and they're not going to let, let little Australia start getting stuck into their profits. I think that's the problem we've, we're facing. But um, I'd, I'd like to go through in the coming week and just see if I can find that original stuff from 20 years ago. I think people would be astounded at what, what's been going on and the amount of research that's been done over time. Okay, I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, yeah, you make some good points, Lindsay. Um... We, we went to a number of talks at the G20 People's Summit talking about trans, uh, multinational corporations, transnational corporations and uh, their in impunity to all of these uh, taxes and these things that really have harmed us. But then again, as you said, it's business as usual and we need to find some sort of a way uh, to use the system against itself. Some of those systems that you were saying uh, with the, to every cent or every dollar, some of those similar systems I've heard of as well. Because um, it doesn't seem from the outside, Jono, that uh, with, with royal commissions and all of these people that may, we may have 
uh, good intentions at hand to try and you know investigate these things and whatnot and all of these um, these these rorts that are happening on a daily basis, it seems like from an external standpoint attacking them head on is not going to be the solution. We have to find some way to increment something within the system that will that will collapse the house of cards in on themselves. Yeah, look, honest trolling in the live chat says that, uh, you know, do you really believe the corporations pay the taxes? They just pass it on to consumers. And I think the point that he's trying to make here is that even if you made the corporations pay their taxes, then we would still be paying. I think that's a point he's trying to make. And without getting into a broad discussion about the monetary system, remember, I'm saying we don't need to be involved in this fake debt-based system that we're currently involved in paying a billion dollars a year of tax to multinational financials. I agree with you completely. The problem that we've got is that most people are indoctrinated, especially the ones who go to university, to believe not only is this system good, it's inevitable, you can't do anything differently, this is how it has to be, anyone who says otherwise is crazy. That, and unfortunately, that's the paradigm we're currently in. So given that most people believe that nonsense, one way we can get them to care about the monetary system is to realize that the corporations are taking money out of this country and giving it to whoever in Singapore, in Ireland, or these low tax jurisdictions, and they're the ones paying large personal income tax. This is one way to get people to think about this topic more. That's why I support the Royal Commission, because again, once people realize just how much they're getting stooged here, they're paying their massive personal income tax, they're paying their GST, their alcohol excises, etc. Once they realize that they're paying their fair share of tax, but the corporations aren't, it might get them thinking more about money. And I believe that at the end of the day, it all goes back to money. Money's evil usury is evil, we could fix everything almost overnight if we got rid of this debt-based evil monetary system. And right now, we do have that system, and one group are clearly doing better than the others, and the others, the ones who are getting stooged, are the peasants. It's you and me, it's our friends and family paying our taxes as the corporations laugh at us as they get engaged in their tax avoidance schemes. Ethan, what say you? I, I completely agree. And uh, it, it seems uh, it, it's it's these corporations on every aspect. You know, we were speaking about Monsanto controlling our food. These these sort of these, the impunity that these corporations have seems almost um, impossible to overcome. But then when you look at it on the grassroots level and realize that we do have all the power if if people just educated themselves and got the ball rolling, as you said, speaking about money, if, if, if people started saying, hey, you go to work, you slave seven days a week, you know what I mean? Do you like that these corporations don't pay taxes and the majority of your wage is spent on all other things and taxes and put into superannuation? I think it's a good, it's a good vocal point to begin and once that snowballed, there could be people in a community that can offer solutions that can that, that can find a way because the power is always in our hands with everything. This debt system doesn't it only exists because we partake in this debt system. If people understood and didn't have to partake in it, then yeah, it, 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 it's a big topic. We don't want to go into a broader thing, but I I agree with what you said about um about about the snowball effect of getting discussion because money is important to everyone. It is, and it affects everyone every day. And the average person in Australia is being taxed at a rate that means that essentially from about lunchtime Thursday through to the end of Friday, they're working for the state. And a lot of people enjoy their jobs and who cares, but a lot of people, they're working because it's their job. They do it to get money and they don't realize that from midday Thursday, on, on average, from midday Thursday through to the time you knock off on Friday, you're literally working for the state. And we're always told that communism is so evil or socialism is so evil or whatever. Well, if you think it's so evil, how come you partake in it? How come you accept it? How come you accept it for yourself, for your family, for your kids? Why? And it's getting worse too. The taxes are only going high. They're talking about raising the GST. They're talking about extending the age that you're going to be with before you get the pension. All these things that make you work harder, work longer, pay more tax. Well, if you're against socialism and communism, great. Well, how come you're supporting it? And this is one way to get people to think about that. You're the one paying the taxes, not the multinational corporations reaping the profits. It's one way to get people to think about the current system. Now, I'd love to talk about this longer, and I will talk more about the economy as time goes on, because like I said, we're $40 billion in deficit. On the day of the Sydney siege, by amazing coincidence, the mid-year economic fiscal outlook was released, and what were we told? The deficit of $30 billion for the year is actually $40 billion and rising. That's what we were told. And since then, Tony Abbott, who campaigned largely on reducing the debt, getting rid of the debt, whatever, he's now saying, oh, $60 billion debt, you know, it's not really that bad. It's, you know, <laughs> the, even the, the government who got in promising to fix it and now admitting they can't fix it, we're in a lot of trouble in this country. We're in some big-time trouble in this country, and it all comes back to money. So the more that we talk about it at a, at a federal level, at an institutional level, the better. But we do have to move on. So we'll move to the final topic for domestic segment today, Lindsay. And this is a topic of yours. It's shopping hours in Queensland. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it, it seems like a mundane sort of a topic, but it's got ramifications, so I'll, I'll just start into it. Um, 
there were two articles this week about trading hours or trading hour changes. The first was in the Courier Mail on the 1st of April um, and the headline read, quote, pit not open to trading changes, end of quote. Now it contained the following, quote, Queensland businesses should be allowed to open whenever they like, according to a landmark report to the federal government. But the Palaszczuk government, which is for people overseas, is the, Queen, the current Queensland government, um, quote, has said a blunt no to the advice. The Harper review into the competition law yesterday highlighted the state's significant restrictions on opening hours and that they only serve to disadvantage bricks and mortar retailers while shoppers spend online whenever they wanted. End of quote. Now basically the report wanted Christmas Day, Good Friday and Anzac Day morning um, and for overseas listeners, Anzac Day is our Remembrance Day for our dead, injured and um, during the, the past wars, um, to be the only times when retailers should be closed. All remaining restrictions should be removed, according to this. Um, I did not refer to the bricks and mortar non-Jewish corner shops. Sorry, it, it did not refer to the non to the to the bricks and mortar non-Jewish corner shops and how they will be a disadvantage. Now these are the little corner shops where you go and buy your milk or your bread or have a coffee or whatever. Um, immediately, this is what struck me about this, immediately the day after this report in the Courier Mail, an article in the business section of the Courier Mail of the 2nd of April was headlined, quote, major retailers fear they may have to hike prices and stop opening stores if the new rules are introduced to keep their powers in check. Woolworths, Coles and a lobby group representing big retailers said the introduction of an effects test could cut innovation and competition. Now my first reaction was, man, talk about leaning on a government. Um, okay, so, so I'll give my comment on this now. So basically they're complaining about competition from internet traders but they're threatening that unless they get their own way with trading hours they won't be able to give competition to retailers in regional areas. They also seem to forget that there are thousands of small retailers who went to the wall when the major retailers were allowed to open on weekends. Now when I was a young bloke they weren't allowed to do that. So if you wanted to get anything on the weekends you had to go to a corner store and that was their, their bread and butter, their, their income. These people want all and they're threatening government with increased prices if they don't get their own way. Now remember that a few years ago there was a fight on between the major shareholders of Coles over control. It came to light that Solomon Liu had over a billion dollars worth of coal shares or coal, the Coles group shares and at least one of the Liebler brothers was on the board so he must have had a fair number as well. With the Myers and others as well, Coles is basically a Jewish organisation no matter how it appears to the outside. This caused me to reread the books The Riddle of the Jews' Success and Anti-Zion. It also reminded me of the collusion of government, media and courts to destroy the multi-million dollar meat business of Rudy Stenko in the US, who was beating the Jews at their own game in an industry which they felt they owned. So the, so the meat industry in the US was pretty much tied up with by Jews and they really did a job on this poor old bloke Rudy Stenko. Um, through the propaganda of church, education, law, government and entertainment, including print, television and movies, they've gradually moulded the white man into their image and it, it's really not a pretty sight. Now, I've, I've got beside that usury. Um, I, with, with the Stenko thing, Sten, Rudy Stenko gave a talk at the Inverell Forum in the early days of that forum and he was in prison for six years on trumped up charges over meat contamination. Um, I'll give a link to this book, he, he had a book he wrote called The Score um, and it has brought a lot of sceptical people on side about a Jewish conspiracy after having read it. It's really quite, quite an eye opening book. Um, the, this is a very deep subject and needs a lengthy discussion. It's a bit like you were just saying about these other topics and, and they'll have to be left for another occasion. But just to finish off this now, I recall buying a t-shirt in which the elastic lasted for only a month. 
and then suddenly they just turned into cleaning rags. So, so, so much for quality in our shops today. Another example is paying $5 for a man's suit in China and they retail it here for $500. This reduction in quality while raising the prices goes back to the 1800s. And the Jew department stores in France and Germany, that's where it originated. Today, it has morphed into a worldwide scam selling Chinese junk at exorbitant prices to all the white nations for whatever the market will bear. I direct you especially to The Riddle of the Jew's Success. It's a wonderful book on this subject. Um, and I'd like you to read that before we do a further discussion on it. Um, because it does show just how far we as a people have have come in our have changed from our innate behavior and honor and consideration centuries ago that's what we had to today's where we've become judaized in so many ways and we don't even realize it i was looking at myself one day and something i did or said and i thought no that's not that's not how we behave that's not our culture i've picked that up off the box so so i i'll, I'll read that the last section again that i read before through the propaganda of church, education, law, government and entertainment, including print, television and movies, they have gradually moulded the white man into their image. And it is really not a pretty sight. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that and I'll throw it back to you, fellas. Well, Lindsay, there's a couple of issues there. The first one is to do with trading hours, and I'll get to that later here because I've got some things to say about that. But first, a lot of people will be wondering, well, how did you make the connection there between uh, the lobbying, the big business lobbying to change legislation and uh, Jewish influence? And especially here in Australia, they might not be aware just how much influence he's had. So I want to read an article here from Haaretz.com. Haaretz is a Jewish newspaper, and I'll quote from it directly. Now, this is entitled, Australian Jews May Top Forbes Rich List but 20% live on the poverty line. Uh, and this is from, uh, what date is this one? Uh, January 2nd, 2013. Quote, Scour Forbes magazine's 2012 annual list of Australia's richest people and the following statistic leaps out. Five of the nation's top 10 billionaires are Jewish. Or to put it more bluntly, 50% of the top 10 hail from a community that comprises just 0.5% of Australia's population of about 22 million people. South African Emiga Ivan Glasenberg, the chief executive of Glencore, is second on the Forbes list with a fortune estimated at around $7 billion. Westfield Group chief Frank Lowy, a Czech-born Holocaust survivor who arrived penniless in Australia by Israel in 1952, is fifth and worth almost $4.5 billion. Property tycoon Harry Trigiboff, the son of Russian Jews who was born in China before immigrating to Australia in 47 is sixth with about $4 billion. Anthony Pratt, the boss of the cardboard recycling giant Busy, whose father came as a refugee from pre-war Poland, is seventh with an estimated $3.5 billion. And Australian-born biz Australian businessman John Gandel, the son of Polish immigrant parents, is listed eighth with $3 billion. Jointly, they have amassed a fortune worth almost $25 billion. Unless there be any doubt, the 2012 list of Australia's richest families, compiled by Business Review Weekly magazine, reads thus. The Smorgan family tops the list with an estimated wealth of more than $2.5 billion. In second spot is the Lieberman family, with a listing of more than $2 billion, followed by the Beeson family, also at over $2 billion. True, they are also among the most philanthropic people in the country, according to Philanthropy Australia, the national peak body for charitable giving. But what neither the Forbes list nor the BRW list reveals is one little known statistic, that about 20% of Jews in Sydney and Melbourne, which jointly houses about 90% of Australia's 110,000 plus, 110, plus Jews, rather, live close to or below the poverty line. And quote, now just in that little article, I read the first part of it there, Ethan, they state quite plainly, yeah, they make up 0.5% of the population, 50% of the billionaires in the country, most of them made their money after World War II. They just went from rags to riches. But in the exact same article, they say, but don't go too far because, um, A, they're very philanthropic. And then the very next section is, oh, but most of the Jews are, or many of the Jews are living in poverty. Now, how they can somehow manage to put those three things in one article with a straight face is beyond me. I'll throw to you. <laughs> oh, it's... As we always say, you can't you can't make this up. Um, there are some pretty great points that have been raised throughout this whole discussion. 
Um, and it, it, again, it just comes back to uh, the the influence that uh, certain individuals, certain corporations, and whatnot have here in this country. And that's where Lindsay made the connection with his uh, his piece that he did just then. And for those that are in Australia right now and not lo watching, look at the influence of these corporations and these certain individualist groups and these lobby groups that have have infiltrated our government since those times and even before then. Uh, look at look at where the money leads. Look at um, these people that are trying to in, you know in, introduce legislation. Look at their names. Look at their families. You know, do research on the people that are controlling every aspect of your life. Not just on the on the on the top levels. Look at them on the puppet levels as well, because you might be able to find out something that uh, you, you, that could enlighten your own self education. And and once you discover these sort of people. Uh, make the connections yourself about uh, why these are, as Lindsay said here in his article, making the connection, John. Yeah, I mean, in that article they say it's, and again, that article that I read out was verbatim from a hard read to Jewish newspaper, so don't come at me with any stupid criticism, which some people will do if they hear what I just said out of context. Hey, don't use the message, I'm telling you what hard read says, and hard is saying they make up 0.5% of the population, 50% of the billionaires. Now, if you think that's entirely reasonable, that by two orders of magnitude they are uh, overrepresented in the billionaires list, Hey, that's up to you. But I think people should be aware of this, and it's funny that you have to read that in Haaretz, but you don't read that in the Herald Sun or the Age. Mm. You think there must be a reason for that. We always hear about how the Muslims are the problem. Like the Muslims are terrorists. Newman Hader was trying to kill people. The Newman Hader incident, of course, was a complete hoax staged event. I mean, we know that, our listeners know that, but we get told about how he's such a problem. What most people don't realize is that, yeah, uh, Jewish people make up 110,000 people of the population here, and they make up uh, five of the billionaires in the top ten list and the three richest families. So, uh, Lindsay, I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you fellas have pretty much summed it up. That, that made a good point because that part of the reason I brought this up was, was to get that sort of message across. I know when Bill Clinton was out here, um, he went round the harbour on a boat. And who, who did he mix with? They were nearly all Jews. So that, that alone shows you who the, the, the shakers and movers are in this country. And that, that's the point I was trying to, trying to get across. But it's not, I think the other point I'm trying to get across too is that, that this isn't a new thing. This goes back, this has been going on for centuries. And these people have gradually got us to the point where we, we don't know who we are or what we are. Like, I'll, I'll take you back. Um, around the, the end of the first millennium, the, a, a usurer, whether, whoever he was, whether he be a Jew or a Christian or whatever, could not be buried in a Christian grave because he was a usurer. It was considered to be that big a problem. It was a horrible thing. Now we've got our government mandating that you, you will have to, I, I'm not sure exactly what the term is, but if you've got money in the bank, we, we, we mandate that, that you should be receiving 2 or 3% on that money or whatever it is for a pension. So they're, 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 what, what to our society was an absolute anatomy close to a thousand years ago, now we've accepted and oh no, this is really good stuff. You know, it, it, I, I, that, that was the point I was trying to get across to people. We need to go perhaps read Riddle of the Jew's Success or whatever and just see what we were like before, how we've changed and how they've done it so skillfully that we don't even know that we've changed. So, so that our whole society now is becoming a Judaized society, not what we originally were. I think that's the point I was trying to get across. I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, and again, Lindsay, most of our listeners, they're loyal listeners, and uh, when they do make constructive criticism, it is constructive criticism, we'll always take that on board. One day, one, once upon a time, soon, one day, there'll come a time when someone wants to take what, something of what we've said out of context and accuse us of being this, that, or the other. It's inevitable, it's going to happen. And when it does, I just hope that anyone who hears the words that we're speaking takes the time to read books like the one that you recommended there, The Riddle of the Jews' Success, Lindsay, or the work of... Of, uh, Kevin B. McDonald, which I can link to at osrantable.com, I would hope that you would take the time to read this work before instantly having the reaction that we've all been programmed to have, like Pavlovian dogs say, oh, you can't talk about that, or if you're talking about that, you must want this or that or the other, because that's how they were programmed by Hollywood. We're programmed to have certain reactions. We're programmed by uh, education to have certain reactions when certain topics are brought up. But as you can see here, Lindsay is citing from a book that was written a long time ago. I'm citing from Haaretz, a Jewish newspaper, just giving you the facts. Now, if you find those facts confronting, don't come at us and accuse us of being X, Y, or Z. Yeah. Ask yourself why the media isn't talking about these things. It's the same reason why last year when the Israeli Defense Force was slaughtering 2,000 innocent Palestinians there in Palestine, why we were told it was the Jews who were the ones who were being harmed. It's the exact same reason why, and we all know what that reason is. All of our listeners know what that reason is. And if you don't yet know what that reason is, then you need to do more research. Ethan, what say you? I 
completely agree. And that's 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 the most vital thing that people can do is research proper proper research. Go to the source references like we do. Go to the actual quotes of the people, quotes of the institutions, quotes of the newspapers, the books that have revealed this. You know, go to the source material. Do your own research and come to your own conclusions, John. Very well said. Well, thank you for bringing that piece of our attention there, Lindsay. We've only got about 35 minutes left, so we better move into the international segment. But you did bring that uh, material to us, so I'll give you the final thought before we move on. No, no. I, I, I think when you gave me a chance a few minutes ago, I pretty much said what I want to say. You I know think, what? I it's, think... been 20, it's been 26 episodes. I think fi one day we'll get the hang of <laughs> throwing to each other the final thoughts. I'll tell you what. We'll move to the international segment now. We're up to uh, almost 50 people watching live. We appreciate every one of you being there. We're reading the, the live comments. We'll try and read out a few more uh, as the rest of the show goes on. The first topic for today, Lindsay, is another one of yours, and it's to do with the BBC 9-11 uh, and a British court ruling that took place a few weeks ago. Take it away. Okay, thank you for that. Um, yeah, uh, a UK... I'll, I'll just quote this. A UK citizen won a law case that the BBC had advanced knowledge of 9-11, and this is from the Paul Craig... Roberts uh, Institute of Political Economy on the 23rd of March 2015 and I'll quote a British judge ruled in favour of a UK citizen who said that the BBC's premature announcement of the collapse of um, WTC or World Trade Centre Building 7 proved advance notice and constitutes a violation of the UK Terrorism Act as the BBC did not report to authorities that the BBC was told the building was down before the event happened that's the end of the quote. Um, I was, and then they go on and they're quoting another site now. Very interesting. Read here, and, and I, I won't through the whole thing because it, it, we'll, we'll have this in our, um, in our website for, for people to go to. But it's just, it's a, it's a global research um, website. Under the UK law, the police have to investigate, but Washington's sock puppet Cameron will invoke national security to block the police investigation of the BBC's advance notice. Now, that's the end of the, the quotes that I wanted to quote on. But I, I will make this following comment. My reading of the global research website that I just quoted above here um, suggests that he, he was not ruled in favour of, um, but he was let off without punishment. That, that's how I viewed it. So it's not quite exactly as the, the headlines suggest. Nevertheless, this is a breakthrough and it may give comfort to US 9-11 activists, particularly veterans today, um, hoping to take action against individuals in the US government over 9-11. Um, it's, it's, it's perhaps not exactly as they say, and it's not the breakthrough that they trumpet, but I think it is a major breakthrough, and it'll give comfort to other people. And, and if they can publicise this, I mean, it, it, must be, it must be obvious to everybody. If the BBC can go on the air and say, look, this building number seven's down, and here it is still standing behind the woman, they had advance notice. Now, if they had advance notice, who gave them the notice? And somebody must have known it was going to come down. So, so you know, that, it just leads on. But anyway, I'll, I'll throw it back to you, Jono. Well, as you know, Lindsay, I get your agenda on the Friday, on the Saturday night or the Sunday morning. I go through the topics you want to talk about, and then if I need to do some background research, I do that. Now, because of what you sent through to me, I went and read the global research article, and this one's entitled BBC Foreknowledge of 9-11 Collapse of WTC Building 7, British Man Won Lawsuit Against BBC for 9-11 Cover-Up, March 10, 2015. And I'm going to read out a couple of quotes from the article, and then I'll play a clip of Mr. Rourke outside of the court uh, officers, uh, and again, this is from the quote. From, this is a quote from Global Research. Quote: Tony Rook, uh, in an act of civil disobedience, refused to pay the mandatory 130-pound TV license fee, claiming it violates Section 15 of the Terrorism Act. Rook's accusation was aimed at the BBC, who reported the collapse of WTC7 over 20 minutes before it actually fell, and the judge accepted Rook's argument. While it was not a public inquiry into 9-11, the recognition of BBC's actions on September 11th are considered a small victory, one that was never reported in the US. In Rook's statement to the court, quote, I believe the BBC, who are directly funded by the licence fee, are furthering the purposes of terrorism, and I have incontrovertible evidence to this effect. I do not use this word lightly, given where I am end quote from uh, Mr. Rook. This is still from the article. Although he was not allowed to show his video evidence in court due to the district judge deeming it irrelevant to the trial, the fact that the BBC reported WC WTC7's collapse over 20 minutes beforehand proved to be evidence enough. He also made reference to the theories behind the collapse of WTC7 being a controlled demolition, as the evidence suggests. In an additional statement, quote, the BBC reported it 20 minutes before it fell. They knew about it beforehand. Last time I was here, I asked you, the judge, 
were you aware of WTC7? You said you had heard of it. Ten years later, you should have more than heard of it. It's the BBC's job to inform the public, especially of miracles of science and when laws of physics become suspended. They have made programs making fools of and ridiculing those of us who believe in the laws of gravity. American reports have shown that the fall was nothing but a controlled demolition. I'm not looking at who demolished it. That is impossible. But the BBC actively tried to hide this from the public. And quote, still from the article, in response from Judge Nichols, even if I accept the evidence you say, this court has no power to create a defence in the manner which you put forward. In light of the evidence the judge took into consideration, Rook was given an unconditional discharge, which in British legal parlance means he was convicted, but he does not suffer the consequences of a conviction, and the conviction will be erased if he is not brought before the court for six months. He was not required to pay the fee and non-payment fine either. Only court costs of £200. And quote again, we'll link to all the articles at osbrandtable.com. Check this out for yourself. But the point that I'm making here is, that the, the judge didn't accept that WTC7 proves the BBC for, had foreknowledge. All the judge did was let this guy go, probably knowing full well that he would appeal further yeah. and the whole thing would get further press. So I guess the basics of all this, Lindsay, I'll throw back to you in a moment, is a man has said, I'm not going to pay my BBC fee. For those who aren't aware, in Britain, you have to pay £130 a year license to the BBC for the privilege of having a TV that can get BBC broadcasting. So it's, it's just like an additional tax, really. I mean, that's how... Orwellian that place has been for a long time. He said, I'm not going to pay it anymore because the BBC uh, had foreknowledge of the building falling down because they were broadcasting it before it happened. Now, most of our listeners are familiar with that. If you're new to the show, you're new to this idea. This is a fact. This isn't disputed that not just two buildings fell down on 9-11. There was a third large building that also fell down called World Trade Center 7. It was like 47 stories large. It also fell allegedly from fires. It wasn't hit by a plane. A still structured... Uh, con a, a, Ethan, help me out here. A solid 47-story building fell down allegedly from fires, and what's worse is the BBC reported it before it happened. Yeah. And this is all there for anyone to check for themselves. So this guy said, well, listen, the BBC must have known. They're terrorists. They're helping terrorists. I'm not going to pay my fee. Here we are a few years later, and he's gotten off. He still has to pay court costs. That is the overall story, Lindsay. I'm so glad you brought this to my attention because I hadn't heard this. Now, I scan our mainstream news every day to get a few nuggets to use on the show. There was no reporting of this, and uh, Ethan, you tell me why. Well, we ju we just finished a segment talking about why, didn't we, Jono? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember. <laughs> I remember when uh, this actually happened. This first began. He first said, "I'm not paying my BBC uh, fee for the for the for the uh, the television." I remember when it first happened. He first came out, and at the time, uh, people that were in the 9/11 uh, uh, skeptic community, 9/11 truth movement, whatever you want to. Uh, Put it under as the, as a label, said that hey, you know this is this could be the beginning of a step to get this mainstream coverage and then uh, get people's attention to the fact that World Trade Center Seven fell into its own footprint at the speed of gravity and defied the laws of physics as we all know, um, and so we thought that this is a positive thing that he can get in and what, what if we all started doing this? What if everyone in the United Kingdom started doing this? What if if we all started uh, you know, lobbying, saying that uh, you know some of these uh, innovative groups in New York City that are going for uh, mayor positions with their parties, talking about safe building initiatives, talking about we just want to come in and enforce more safety rules because this building collapsed due to fire. We want to make it, and then that would expose that buildings can't collapse due to fire like that, and it's impossible. These sort of innovative methods were all happening at this time, and uh, I think that just reinforces. Uh, what we thought at the time because the judges just let him off because he didn't want it to go further because of potential greater press, John, as we've said. Now, Lindsay, I'll throw that one back to you, uh, you know, just to get some uh, final thoughts on what is going on at the moment um, and where where we can go through from here just in the overall spectrum of uh, trying to get this information out to the public. Yeah, I, I don't know where you will. Um, like, that the whole, the whole media... The, the public media is controlled and they're not going to try and let this out because we've discussed this before. The people who are involved in the trade centre were the same people who own the media and, you know, it just goes on. So I, I don't think you're going to get it out. It'll have to go out via alternative media. You know, the little tiny part we play, you know, may, may um, make some people aware. It probably has to go out through all the, the alternative media. Um, and... and I don't, I don't know what else you do with this. The, the only thing, like I mentioned the uh, veterans today, because I know, I think they were trying to take Cheney on or somebody like that, and and th this might give them some impetus to do that. They might be able to refer to that and then take action against him. So you need somebody like veterans today. You've got a, 
a few bob behind them, and and they've got some um, but aggressive uh, leadership, and they may be able to make inroads into this. But I I, I don't think there's a hell of a lot we can do um, because, like we said, that everything's controlled. They're not going to put something like this, which which is so damning to them and their propaganda. Okay, I'll throw it back to you. I'll tell you one thing we can do, Lindsay, and that's to support the people who've already gone out of their way, stuck their neck out to do something publicly, like Mr. Tony Rook has done. So what I'll do now is play a clip. Again, the video will be available at osrantable.com. I want to play this clip right now of Mr. Rook outside of the court after the ruling that I just spoke of. This is about a 90-second clip. Uh, please bear with the audio quality. We're still getting the technical side of playing videos sorted out, but you should be able to hear the audio from this. This is Tony Rook outside the court after that decision that I just read out. I said, look, I'm not paying your licence under Section 15, Article 3 of the Terrorism Act. Um, and they went through the procedure. I got the court summons, uh, went to court. They asked me if I was guilty. I said, no, I'm not guilty of having an appropriate licence because the licence isn't appropriate. I'll we'll be funding terrorism because I know the BBC is covered up the two events of the day. And eventually we arrived here today and um, the result has been, and I have to say a fair judge in my opinion, um, that I have not been convicted. Uh, I have no fine. Uh, court costs £200, which you guys have very generously donated to. Um, and I have to behave myself and get a TV license, of course, which I'll be running down the post office tomorrow to buy. Um, but hopefully we've set a little a little precedent here where it might encourage people to go and do the same thing. And, uh, you know, go to their police, tell them about today, um, give them the evidence. Uh, West Sussex Police have said they're investigating it, which they're obliged to do, because the BBC had prior knowledge of the terrorist event, which under, I think, it's Section 38 of the Terrorism Act, uh, they should have reported, which they didn't. And they've since given this, uh, since given us this impossible flannel about World Trade Center cell collapsing due to an office fire, which uh, even in the NIST report says uh, fell at three full speed for eight floors in a 2.5 seconds. Now that is absolutely impossible without a controlled demolition being involved. Absolutely impossible. There's no arguments around it. Don't let anyone else tell you otherwise because they're saying Isaac Newton is wrong. So that's the clip again. The video will be available at osroundtable.com. I apologise for the audio quality. The video, whoever was recording him speak, uh, got all the, the background noise. That's why you heard that. But hopefully you could hear what he was saying. He was just saying, matter of factly, here's what happened in the court. He said he thought the judge was fair, even though he still has to now go and get his BBC licence and he had to pay court costs. He wasn't convicted. He's saying, well, that's fair enough. He's made his point. He knows what he's doing. This guy's being smart. And there are lots of people out there working alone as lone wolves, as almost guerrilla warfare, because we're in an information war. We are in an info war. It's a shame that Alex Jones took that label, but that's literally what we're in an info war. And I think sometimes the best work you can do is guerrilla work. And people like him are doing the guerrilla work. They're taking these matters to court, getting publicity. Now, is the mainstream media going to report on this? Of course they're not. That's where we come in, Ethan. And someone like him is exactly the kind of guy that we should be supporting. What say you? Yeah, I completely agree, John. And and it goes back to what I was saying about uh, innovative methods like this to get messages out. Uh, Lindsay said um, he probably doesn't uh, see that it it can get out, and 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 as the years go on, it sees it. it it seems like it's going to be harder and harder to try and get this message out because, you know, if, if people still haven't realised that 9-11 was a lie in 2015, um, how are they going to go further down the rabbit hole and discover everything else is a lie? Um, I still think it's, it, it, it's vital to plant the seeds because it's the one thing you can easily prove was a lie, but, you know, the laws of physics disprove that. You, you, there's no assumption. There's people out there, legitimate people, with all different kinds of theories of what brought the towers down, but the main premise is that the official story is a lie, and they lied to us, and this is what he's saying. The BBC had a prior knowledge of this information and, 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 and who was responsible behind it, perhaps, but they covered that up, and uh, he's made his point, and we need to make our point too, and that's why alternative media is so vital is because we wouldn't be hearing about this guy unless it was for the alternative media, so we've got to continue pressing on, John. Exactly right. And look, Honest Trolling in the live chat says that uh, he thinks the vast majority of people still don't know about World Trade Center 7, uh, Building 7. I would completely agree with him. As you know, in my real-world life on the ground, I do like to talk to people about these things any chance that I get. Like PK7, episode 17, even if you're at the fish and chip shop, if something on TV comes up, use that as a way to chat with other people who are waiting for their fish and chips. Just spread seeds. Like you said, it's the main thing that we can do. And Honest Trolling says he thinks that most people don't know about World Trade uh, Center 7. And I think a lot of people, when they do find that, I've seen this as well, 
They shrug their shoulders. They find an excuse for it. In fact, I showed a gentleman maybe three weeks ago that exact video of the building coming down after BBC had uh, reported it. You know, BBC <laughs> reported it first, and then he started saying, "Well, how do we know this video is real?" And I was like, "Well, this isn't disputed. This is the video. Like they they just don't talk about it. They don't deny it because it actually happened." And the cognitive dissonance kicked in. Now that will happen to most people for sure. But what chance do we have if we don't at least try with people? And Building Seven is an excellent in to get them thinking about it. Lindsay, what say you? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you, because um, I remember saying when PK was talking about it, I thought, yeah, that you're probably right. We've probably got to confront people all the time um, to do this. But uh, as, a, as like a mass movement throughout the world, I don't know. It's, it's not going to happen straight away, because they're going to purposely sabotage it. It's, it's going to have to be word of mouth. I, I, I agree with you there. Um, okay, I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, I mean, with this show, we largely preach to the converted. Most of our listeners are well aware of most of what we talk about. We try and cover a diverse range of topics so that things that people aren't familiar with, they can go and check out. And we have a live chat going so people can give us ideas of things to research. Sometimes someone makes a comment, I write it down, then I go and research it. So this is like a collaborative effort for those of us who have already broken through that paradigm. I guess what we're talking about here are tactics that you can use to help other people go from the zombie paradigm to the thinking paradigm. Now, none of us went from believing the TV to knowing everything that we know now. It's a process. There's much reading involved, much thinking involved, much talking involved for sure. But what I think it's useful to do is to think back to what it was that got you thinking the way that you do. Was it the Boston bombings? Was it Sandy Hook? Was it 9-11? Was it Waco? What was it? What did you see? What did you hear? Who spoke to you? What was it that got you to go from believing the mainstream media to then wanting to do your own research and try and use those exact tactics again? And I think one of the best ways is to focus on the undeniable and World Trade Center 7 is undeniable. 47-story building coming down due to allegedly office fires and BBC reporting it before it happened. You can't dispute that. You can try like that gentleman did a few weeks ago. You can come up with a cognitive dissonance and try and weasel out of it. And if you're a weasel, if you're morally weak, you will just avoid it altogether. But the people who still have moral fibers in their body, in their hearts, will think about this. They'll go away and it might be the plant. It might be the seed that gets the plant starting to grow. We do have many topics to talk about today, so we'll move on to topic two of international. Now, we were going to talk about Facebook, uh, Ethan, but I know you've got a lot of things to talk about on that topic, so we'll save that for next week. Yeah. Yeah. The point that I was going to make on the Facebook was, of course, that there is a Metapedia.org article that talks about the fact that many Jews were involved in the 9-11 false flag attack, and, of course, there was a Vicar in Britain who we reported on a couple of months ago who made a post on his Facebook simply stating the name of the article and asking, do you agree with it? Simply for posting a link to the Metapedia article saying, here's undeniable facts of all of these Jewish people who are involved. Larry Silverstein, Frank Australia's Frank Lowy, a whole bunch of Jewish people who profited from 9-11. Are they possibly connected in the plot? Simply for posting a link to Metapedia, he was publicly chastised, had to apologise, and was banned from Facebook for six months. So that was a point that I was going to make once you did your segment on Facebook, but I'm going to do it anyway. We'll do your segment on Facebook next week. Yep. We'll move to the next topic, which was going to be number three. It's now number two. Lindsay, that's you. And I've got some information for us on the American millennials. Uh, they're educated, but they're apparently unskilled. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, this is a very small article, so it won't take long. Um, it was from CBS Money Watch on the 13th of March. Um, and I'll quote, Bad news ahead for American workforce. Its millennial generation is flunking the basics. Americans born after 1980 are lagging their peers in countries ranging from Australia to Estonia, according to a new report from researchers at the Educational Testing Service. And another quote, it hints that students may be falling behind not only in their early educational years, but at college level. In Japan, Finland, the Netherlands, Young adults with only a high school degree scored on par with American millennials holding four-year college degrees, the report said. A decade ago, the skill level of American adults was judged mediocre, the report said. Now it is below even that. Now, the reason I brought this up, I thought, I'm, I'm interested in this, and is it the case in Australia as well? That was my first question. Um, now, the other thing too is um, when they're talking about college, I, I, my understanding it is in America that their college is actually what we would call a university degree or something like that. So, so I think that that was, you might even be able to enlighten us more on this, um, Jono. Um, but but my, my main reason was I wanted to ask you fellas what were your feelings about this and, and does it confirm our belief that the education system in nearly all the white nations is designed to dumb down our youth? Now, we've been talking about this for a long time. Um, I'll throw it back to you, um, 
Jono, to start with and see what you have to say and, and then perhaps Ethan can throw his bit in. Yeah, so the, the things to take away from that article are that based on the tests that they did, they found that American uh, college graduates, university graduates who'd done four-year degrees uh, were no more capable than high school graduates in parts of Europe. And that doesn't surprise me at all. And I think Australia is fast going the same way. I mean, I've said before on the show, I think how you can now get into teaching degrees out of high school, even if you're in the bottom half of the cohort from your high school. That is, you can be in the in the bottom 50% of people finishing high school and get into university degrees to become a teacher. Now, if you can't see a problem with that, <laughs> then I can't help you. And we're fast going that way. I was involved in the university sector for a number of years there, Ethan, as you know. And uh, even in my relatively brief time there, I saw standards slipping. And that's just talking about the domestic students. That's not even bringing into the fact that we are now being flooded out in our universities by foreign students. And this is just an open secret. I mean, everyone knows this, that the foreign students are given essentially a free ticket to pass. So long as they're trying and they're paying their money, they'll get through. It's very rare that a foreign student will get failed more than a couple of times, uh, more than a couple of courses over the course of their degree. They're going to get the degree because they're paying the money and they're trying. That's simply the way that it is most of the time. Now, even if that's a, a non-official policy for the international students, that's invariably going to affect the domestic students anyway because of a number of things, including teaching. How do you teach two different groups in the same class? But also group work. And I and many of our listeners have been that person who wasn't quick enough on week two or three when they put you in groups and you look around and you're like, oh no, not again. <laughs> I, sh I should have learned my lesson last year. Week two and three sit near the domestics because the internationals, hey, they're trying to learn in a different language. It's not their fault. Like they're just trying to get a degree and like I've got no issue with any of that. It should be us saying, well, we can only take those who have competent uh, language skills because this is an English-speaking institution, at least for the next 10 or 20 years, Ethan. Yeah, I, c I completely agree. Um, and I think if we actually looked at it from a broader spectrum, um, Australia would be worse than what has just been read out. I think we'd be behind all of them because the levels of education, especially myself being involved uh, more recently than yourself and, and obviously Lindsay in the education system, being involved in the education system since I left, going you know with teachers that I know, going into classrooms, helping uh, you know teach classes and whatnot. Um, the level of standard for the teachers themselves is is appalling, and then the content that they're pushing out is not only controlled, but it's also an appalling standard. Where now, uh, you, I mean, you can see it with these uh, RTOs, these trade or uh, these training organisations, these registered trade or training organisations, rather. Anyone can get a diploma now. It's vet free. You know what I mean? Diplomas mean nothing now. Um, it gets you straight into university. You don't even have to be barely, you know, you don't have to be English speaking. And you don't have even have to, there's diplomas that are teaching people that I know of personally um, that, that 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 don't speak English and they're trying to teach them a diploma to get them straight into university where they'll go in. There's no people that can't read people they and um, they say oh that's a way to get the people that are lacking in all of these sort of intellectual capabilities a way to get them a, a more prosperous future. I I, I agree with the. Yeah, theology behind that, um, but at the same time, our standards drop, our standards drop, and RTOs are being hammered in this country right now because they're pumping out people that can't get employed and people that are destroying real organisations in the world because there's not enough quality control here in this country. So I think if you looked at it, Lindsay, uh, we'd be far further behind it. What say you? Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I can remember quite a long, number of years ago, um, my kids had a school teacher and she used to say use and that used to grate on me you know and, and I thought man how can the kids learn proper English if the if the teachers can't do it so I think the rot has been set in for quite a long time now I, I don't want to dump on all the teachers I'm quite sure the summer are really quite capable but it, it does concern me when you when you say uh, like Jono just said that um, they're, they're coming in from the lower 50 percent and going and doing a degree to become a teacher to teach to teach the kids it, it, it does concern me yeah anyway I'll, I'll throw it back to you again it, it should be concerning and of course a lot of our best and brightest young minds they're going into things like actuarial studies and accounting and um, the old law commerce double degree because that's where the money is if you go to a sandstone university and you do yourself a law commerce double de commerce being like accounting or finance and a law degree you do that double and you get good marks and there's a good chance we'll get into one of the big four accounting firms or one of the big law firms or even better one of the big investment banking firms and that's where the money is. Now there's a, a couple of major problems with that. The first one is on the individual level 
they will then slave away for the first few years of their career. It's almost like a sweatshop. These are things that are almost like pyramids, right? Where you get into one of the big four accounting firms, it's going to look good on your resume, you can stay long enough and make big money. But there's a lot of people who want that graduate position. And so you're all working hard, especially around audit time and a financial year. You work in 60, 70 hour weeks. It's just expected, it's just part of being in that job. That's for the big four accounting. Investment banks, it's not uncommon for people to work 80, 90 hour weeks. And that's just the culture of the place. They know that many people will burn out. They expect that. If you're one of the people who get through that first couple of years of burning out, hey, next thing you're on some good money. But even then, it's the old golden handcuffs. You've just given up half of your 20s, maybe all of your 20s to get to a good position. Now you just have to keep working harder, and who knows, in five years, you might be on twice the money. So you see for a lot of people, they get in thinking, I'll do this for a couple of years and I'll get out. And a lot of them, they get out really quickly before they've made the money to make it worth it. The other ones who stick around, they've given up their 20s and even their 30s, their real life, their youth, they'll never get back. To what? Make money? Just another example of how money is so evil. That's on the individual level. But then on the societal level, if our best and brightest minds, instead of going into teaching and going into things like law and commerce and actuarial studies to make the money, then who's left over to teach the next generation of kids? Essentially, the dregs of the cohort. Now, I know a lot of our listeners might have done so well at school. I completely agree. School is no arbiter of how intelligent you are. Oh, yeah. Quite the contrary. I completely agree with you. But at the moment, things like the tertiary entrance ranking is the only thing that we have. It's the main thing that we have to grade who should get into what degrees. And the reality is that there are so few of the best and brightest minds going to teaching that people who do very poorly at high school are the very next year going to teaching degrees. That's the reality. So when I hear that four-year college students in America are doing no better than high school students in, um, in, uh, in, in Europe, it doesn't surprise me at all. Australia's fast head on the same path. And as many of our live listeners have been commenting, Greg Williams said that they're just trying to get a whole bunch of slaves, and we've discussed this on the show, the fact that now people are going into debt to get their degree. It's just like indentured servitude. Once upon a time, they said, we'll take you to the new land, to the, to the land where there's jobs, but you work for us for a couple of years before you're free. Well, now it's the same, except you're going to no, no new land. You'll just get a job in the city. You spend a few years doing your degree, then you'll take years and years and years to pay that degree off just to get a white-collar job, and they've completely destroyed our manufacturing base. So what's left? White-collar jobs. And, of course, there's a credentialization going on. So now jobs that used to get trained on the job, like, say, being a journalist, now you need to get a degree to get a job at the mainstream outlets. So once upon a time, they provided you the training. Now you've got to go into debt just to get a piece of paper to possibly get a job. That's the reality facing right. Australia today. Now, people might listen to certain segments that we do and not like the topics we discuss. Well, that's up to you to do your own research to find out if what we're saying is real or fake. But I think most Australians, if they heard what we were discussing right now, they know that everything we're saying is completely true and the mainstream media isn't talking about it and there's a reason for that because they're in on the whole thing. Lindsay, what say you? Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Um, one of these days we might have to do another big long session on this whole process that you've you've brought up about foreign students, um, the, the the indenture system. Um, but um, from my point of view, I this didn't happen to me. I had free education if I wanted it when when I was younger. But I I look at these kids now and think they've probably run up forty grand before they can get married. Now before they can buy a house, before they can have children. They've got to try and get on on top of this this huge debt they've they've run up just just to get an ordinary run of the mill job where they're earning you know eighty grand a year or something you know it, the, things are completely gone wrong with the system and I, I it does need a a major um, this discussion about it and what we what we think would, would be the answers to it but um that's probably about all I can say at the moment. Fair enough, mate. Well, I'll tell you what, I've got a couple more topics I want to get through, so we'll wrap that one up there. Once again, all the links that we refer to are provided on osroundtable.com. We encourage people to check out the links, do their own research, come to their own conclusions. We're just three guys sitting around talking about what we believe, giving you the reasons why we believe it. And if you want to believe it, it's up to you to do your own research to make sure we're telling the truth. If you want to argue with us, it's up to you to do your own research and make sure that we're wrong before you come out and say that. That's the idea of open discussion. Now, we've got enough time for maybe one more topic, and the next one on the list is anti-Islam ads on buses in Philadelphia. Now, this is just a quick one. This is from RT.com. It's entitled, Islamic Jew Hatred Ads with Hitler Appear on Philadelphia Buses, April 2, 2015. Quote, controversial ads showing a 1941 photo of a Muslim leader meeting Hitler have begun appearing on buses in Philadelphia after courts overruled the transit authority's objections. Islamic Jew hate, it's in the Koran. Two-thirds of all U.S. aid goes to Islamic countries. Stop the hate. End all aid to Islamic countries, the ad reads, next to the photograph of Adolf Hitler and the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al-Husseini. Behind the campaign is the American Freedom Defense Initiative, a pro-Israel group led by blogger Pamela Geller. AFDI has previously run the ad in public transit systems of New York, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. They reportedly paid $30,000 
for the Philadelphia ads end quote. So basically what they're saying here is there's a group, a pro-Israeli group, who are running ads on buses stating, quote, Islamic Jew hate, it's in the Quran. Two-thirds of all U.S. aid goes to Islamic countries, stop the hate, and all aid to Islamic countries, end quote. Lindsay, I don't know if you saw this one during the week, but what are your thoughts on this? Uh, no, I didn't see that at all. Um, they're, they're, this has been on the go for a while in America. I, I know there were people who were trying to put up ads on buses, and then they they put up a, the counter ad, and and the the bus companies were were refusing to take ads, and you know there's there's been a long running battle about this from a, a number of sides. Um, so I because I didn't see this during the week, I hadn't really had a, th a chance to have a think about it and and go into you know what was what was the, the, the originating idea behind it, and etc. But um, once again, I've, if I get a chance during the week, I'll go in and, and go back to who started all this off. I know, I know it's been going on for a few years now. Um, not not Eddie Islamic, but there's been a, a fair bit of give and, give and take between different groups giving each other a serve on, on, um, on bus advertisements. Um, yeah, no, I've got nothing further to add to that. Thanks. It's interesting, isn't it? We reported back on episode 16 of the Australian Untable podcast the fact that there are three people in Australia in particular who seem to have been uh, hit by the pro-Israel, pro-Jewish lobby. And one of them is a man named Brendan O'Connell, who of course was imprisoned for stating that he believes that Judaism is a religion of hatred, of death, of destruction, these kind of things. That's his opinion, right? And for stating that publicly in an open area, he ended up finding himself in prison for, I think, a couple of years. I might be mistaken there. He, to compare that to what's happening here, I mean, I know they're two different countries. I'm not saying they're the same, but let's compare that, what happened in Perth, Australia, to a man criticizing Judaism, to what hap what's happening over in uh, you know, the United States and some of their bigger cities with ads on buses saying that uh, Islam, is, is Muslims hate Jews, it's in the Koran. Now, how many people know what's actually in the Talmud? Now, I will throw to you there again, Lindsay. I don't know if you have your notes in front of you, but very briefly, I know that you have studied the Talmud to some degree. Would you agree that there's a little bit of hatred in there as well? Yeah, yeah, I think there's quite a lot of hatred. Um, you know, and and it, it, it's not just what's in the, the Talmud, but it's how it manifests itself in the people who have studied the Talmud and believe it's correct. Um, you know, that, that allows... Um, and prime ministers of Israel to call Arabs cockroaches and you know that, and things like that. So, <laughs> um, I there, there's this word goy. Everybody keeps going on about goy meaning cattle, and and it may well do. I mean, to me, I've I've looked it up, and it only just means nations. But I know there is. They they, they are the only people who are really men. Everybody else are like subhumans. So so I know you know to them that might not be hatred, but. Certainly, if you're one of the, the subhumans, you, you do interpret that as hatred. Yeah. Well, I mentioned okay, uh, Mr. Ovadia Yosef, the late Ovadia Yosef, uh, a few weeks ago. Now, he was a, a head rabbi in Israel. He started a party that's still very powerful there to this day. And he was quoted even by Jewish newspapers that might have been at the time of Israel, might have been Haaretz, as stating that uh, the Muslims are snakes and that he doesn't want to do any deals with the snakes because you can't trust them and also stating that uh, people like yourself, myself, and most of our listeners, um, you know, we were born to serve the Jew. We were born to, to work for them, to, to procreate and to die, and they were born to eat like a Fendi off our labor. Now, those are their words, not mine, and yet here we are listening to uh, people claim that it's the Muslims who hate the Jews. And isn't it funny, Ethan, that if you took the average social justice warrior and had them listen to our show, we're the ones who are probably defending the Muslims more than they are because we're the ones stating that all the things in the mainstream media saying they're evil, it's all nonsense. Newman Hader, complete hoax. Uh, that whole event didn't happen. If it did, it didn't happen the way that we were told. And Muslims aren't the problem that we're told they are. In fact, there's one group who are mostly in charge of telling us that Muslims are the problem, and it's probably a classic deflection. What say you? I, I completely agree. I agree with everything, uh, mostly everything that's been said. And I, sent, I, I discovered this article during the week, and uh, for people that haven't seen this, and we'll provide links, they're literally... On the sides of buses, and there's picture. There's a picture of Hitler with Palestinian leaders all across the country, saying in big capital letters, you know, Islam, Islam, Jew hatred. It's in the Quran, just encompassing all of these aspects of just control and brainwashing and programming that we've talked about. How you how you can't criticize certain Jewish lobbyist groups and 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 the Jewish control system that is it has enslaved us. Islamophobia—that all of these things are are a result of of 
um, big bad evil Muslims, and uh, it, it's 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 combining it all together in just this propaganda campaign and adding Hitler on the side of the bus too. Like, it, it, if I didn't see it for myself, I couldn't believe it, John. Well, you sent that through to me as a link. You obviously thought that I'd like it. I did. I've liked it enough to bring it up uh, today. <laughs> I should say, by the way, that. If people want to go to that effort to make those kind of ads to criticize other groups, I don't have a problem with that first. I mean, I'm not saying they shouldn't be allowed to do that legally. I mean, I believe in free yeah. speech. Let them do it legally. Criticize them as individuals for doing that and going out and attacking this other group and making these claims. But if you're going to do that, at least be consistent and let other people attack your group. And we know they don't do that. In fact, Frederick Tobin here in Australia was also in prison for a few months uh, for contempt of court when a judge uh, ordered him to take down his website where he challenged certain aspects of the so of the Holocaust narrative, and then when he went to court, they wouldn't let him introduce into evidence evidence that he had to prove that certain aspects of the Holocaust narrative are complete bunkum. They wouldn't let him do that. They said, "Well, he didn't listen to your evidence. That's not what this is about." <laughs> they, they, they actually said that, and here we are listening to someone say, "Oh, uh, hatred of the Jews is in the Koran," which, by the way, it could be. I haven't actually read the Koran. That is possible. All I'm saying is, let's be consistent here. And if you're allowed to demonize an entire group of people based on what's in their text, okay. Let's have at it. Let's have a big open discussion Let's... of what's really in the Talmud. Now, I think we've got just enough time for one more topic before we wrap it up, and this was to do with drones used to disperse crowds in India. This is from the Times of India, uh, April 3, 2015. It's entitled, Now, Drones to be Used to Disperse Mobs in Lucknow. Quote, Drones will soon perform a special task in the state capital, apart from functioning as eyes in the sky, with the Lucknow police planning to use them for dispersing mobs. These little unmanned mini choppers are already in use in various sensitive parts of the Uttar Pradesh for taking aerial snaps, but for the first time the high-tech gadget will be used to control unruly crowds. We have purchased five drone cameras with capacity of lifting two kilos. They can be used to shower pepper powder on an unruly mob in any case of any trouble. Senior Superintendent of Police Yashavi Adav told PTI here today. The drone camera, he said, made its debut in the city when the district administration deployed the device for surveillance last year during Muharram and also during the Lucknow Mahotsav and Republic Day Parade. The drones can fly up to 600 metres in one kilometre radius, Yadav said, adding that the drone surveillance will be formally launched by Chief Minister Akhila Yadav later this month. And quote, so there you have it. This is a country literally using drones on their own people. Now, they're still not loading them with guns to use on their own people, but they're going to do this gradually. Yeah. First, use them for surveillance. Then you use them for pepper spray. Eventually, you'll use them for zapping people or what have you. Then you'll start using them to drop dye on people so they can be identified by police on the ground. And eventually, this will move to using them for weapons. If you can't see that, you can't see anything. Lindsay, what say you? Yeah, yeah, I agree entirely. And and this ties in with something I saw the week during the week that, that they were also going to start... Um, aerially spraying us with um, vaccination material, so so you don't even have to have a needle now. So so it just goes on. Where where does it end? I mean, it, it's up to the individual where your mind goes to. What what else could they do with these damn things from the air? You know, it, I've, I've said it a long time ago. I, I'm quite worried that they might even start taking out houses in the suburbs when they they feel like they've um, found a terrorist or whatever. You know, I, I, it, it's it's endless what what they can do. And it to me, it really is quite frightening. I I don't trust any of these people. I don't think they they know how to um, um, to, to use their powers. Um, they have no restraint, and and I think they'll go to whatever degree they want to go to, and they'll just they'll just use the, the press to um to to dampen down any criticism. Yeah, no. Anyway, I I agree entirely with you. You know how I feel about this. Okay, back to you. Yeah, Lindsay, I I agree. And um, as as Jono said, it's only a matter of time before um th this starts. It, uh, the plot starts thickening, and it's going to happen here as well. We've I've spoke. I did a massive uh, piece on drones here in Australia, which I'm going to turn into an article with uh, you know, a, a video similar to the Sydney siege uh, video that we did about the sniper, um, talking about the influence that drones have had here in this country and how they're surveilling. And they want them to patrol the borders. How we've helped drones bomb over in the United uh, from our Pine Gap base here, our joint US spy agency, we've helped drone bomb in Yemen and Pakistan and Libya and all these countries. Um, and now they want to use them for surveillance. They're normalizing them to be used to spy on your neighbors for their pools, you know what I mean, to see if, um, if, if the gates around the pool are secure, all of this stuff. And it's not long. The G20 is a perfect example. They used it to monitor crime before the G20 summit happened. There was drones flying around in the sky for so-called bikey gangs, <laughs> and now 
they're going to use that here. And drones, modernized weaponry is not going to be with humans. Wars aren't going to be fought with humans. It's going to be drones. And they're going to, as this is a perfect example, guys. And going, the programmed minds will say to you, oh, but if they can use drones and make it safer, don't you want them to do that? And, of course, they're working on this false preconceived notion that there's something to keep us safe from. They work on this preconceived notion that it's dangerous out there, that it's terrible out there because they're watching so much television. And I really believe, yes, the average person, especially today, isn't a particularly um, strong critical thinker. I agree. But I think our biggest issue right now isn't that most people can't think critically, that they're not trained to do it. That, that is a problem. I agree. The biggest problem right now is that so many people get their information from the television. They spend hours in front of the television, and that becomes their worldview. And if you could just get the average person to spend a few weeks away from the television, away from the internet and the videos that are just as bad on the internet as they are on TV, get them away from all of that nonsense, get them mixing with their fellow humans and say, hold on, we're not really out to hurt each other, any of us. We, we're not causing any problems for each other. Where is this great problem coming from? And they'll say it's coming from the TV. They're being scared into thinking they need protection. It's a classic problem reaction solution, Hegelian dialectic. Here's your problem. Everything's so bad. Everything's so terrible. It's scary out there. Here's, this, here's the reaction. You guys are getting angry, scared, whatever. Here's a solution. Drones in the sky to pepper spray you, to surveil you, and eventually to shoot you, which is clearly their plan. Now, I could talk about this topic for a while. It's very important. But we're up to two hours now. We have to wrap the show up. We try and keep the two hours. So what we'll do is we'll go around the panel for our final thoughts. For live listeners, of course, bear in mind, because we're up to like, over 50 people watching live, which is fantastic. Stick around. We'll do the Q&A like we always do, but for the official upload, it is time to wrap it up. So we'll go around the panel. We'll start with you there, Lindsay. Any final thoughts for episode 26 of the ARP? Um, yeah, I thought it went pretty well. I, I like the, the, the broad um, range of topics we've handled. Um, and I've, you've, obviously this, to, this week we've come up with stuff that, that I'd not even seen before. So I was, it's really good for me. It's almost like I'm one of the listeners. Um, so I'm I'm really pleased with the way it's gone. I hope it hope the people who are listening outside feel the same way. All right, I'll, I'll, that that's about all I had to say. Thanks, Lindsay, for joining us again. Um, it's always good to have you here. Uh, my final thoughts, um, just everything that Lindsay said about uh, how I enjoyed the show. But I also really wanted to just encourage people to do their own research and do it properly. If um, if you if you just hear, heard a term. If you heard a term or a keyword or a phrase that we've said in this episode, if you if John had just said Hegelian dialectic, and you didn't know what that means, set aside a couple hours a day to to research what that means. If if John says cultural Marxism, set that aside to research what that means. If you're not familiar with these sort of terms, because little terms like this can reveal a bigger picture. If we if there's a book that Lindsay's referring to, uh, the riddles of Jewish success. Um, research these sort of things and research and probably just set, set a couple hours. It's not that hard and uh, it could change your world perspective. And that's what we're trying to do with this show. We're trying to encourage people to not only have a community where they can get vital information from, it's to encourage them to, to enlighten their, their own research and, and to continue that and, and to spread it amongst people. So that's my final thoughts. Uh, just, you know, just to do your own research, keep constantly and consistently refreshing your memory with these terms and uh, what's going on in the agenda at hand, John. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. And uh, Rick Sullivan in the live chat says that it's good to see some Aussies talking some sense. And that's what we're trying to do because there are a number of outlets in the alternative media of Australia who are doing good work and uh, hopefully in time we can cross promote with them more. But the reality is there aren't that many people doing this kind of work. If you want to hear people talking the truth about who runs the media and the evil of usury and uh, the use of drones, what's coming in the future, what's really happening at the geopolitical level, any of that kind of stuff, you can't go to the mainstream media anymore. You can use them as a, as a basic idea to get to know what they want you to think, but then you have to do your own research. Now, we can only do so much on this show, Ethan, so we present what we think is uh, true and, and, and accurate, but we encourage people to go and double check what we provide. That's why we put so much time into osroundtable.com where we provide all of the links for people to do their own research. Now, I spend an hour or so every week updating all of the links that Lindsay provides, that Ethan provides, that I provide, so you can double-check everything. I don't expect you to sit there and double-check everything I say, but if you find a topic interesting, use that as a platform to do further research because, hey, we're just three people here. We'd love to get more people on board on a regular basis. We'd love to, we'd love to have some of you guys join us on the panel. Maybe there's a topic that you're interested in. Well, the best way to get on the panel is to provide evidence that you've got good research behind you, and the best way to start is to start doing that research. Now, I know a lot of our listeners do do their own research. That's terrific. For those of you who aren't doing the research, who aren't reading books, who aren't doing your own thinking and talking, there's nothing stopping you from starting. I don't pretend to be a particularly intelligent person. I know that Ethan doesn't. Lindsay's a very humble guy. I've met him in person uh, many times, and he's one of the most humble people I've ever met. We don't pretend for a moment that we're any smarter than anyone. 
but we do spend a lot of time doing the research in the hope that we make ourselves a little bit more informed and also that we might be able to help you get more informed as well. So please, if you haven't already started doing this, I'm sure most of you have, but for those who haven't, you really need to start doing your own independent research. We can only do two hours or so of this kind of stuff a week and really you shouldn't be relying on any individual show or person. You've got to do your own research, so I completely agree with everything that Ethan said. A couple more points. There was a rare gem in the corporate media. Every now and then they do post something that's decent. So I'm going to provide a link on osmantable.com to an article from Brisbane Times. That's Fairfax, where a guy basically states that the whole war on drugs is complete nonsense and it's hurting us. I agree with him completely. That'll be there on osmantable.com. Remember, there's no ads on osmantable.com. So when you visit there, you're not going to be asked for money. You won't get uh, pop-ups from money. There'll just be a whole bunch of information. Hopefully you can check that out. Of course, we are on Podbean now, so you can get our MP3s and download them to your phone or to your computer. Listen to them in the car on the way to work, whatever. Share them with your friends. MP3 files are provided for you. All you have to do is click download again. They're available on osroundtable.com. And that leads me to my final thought, which is that we have had a number of people offer to, to give us some money to help with the running cost of the show. We're so thankful for those offers. We will eventually think of a way to, to accept the money and use it in the best way possible. A few people have already uh, transferred the money through to the others who have offered it. We appreciate the offer. We just haven't taken the money yet because we're still thinking of a way to, to make it the most efficient way that we can. In the meantime, if you want to help the show, the best way to do it is to share it with your friends and family. We provide timestamps on all of our episodes so that you can link to a certain topic. So maybe you're reading a forum one day and they talk about GMOs and someone says, oh, the, the media don't talk about it. You might link to us and say, hey, uh, you might link to minute 37 of this show and say, hey, here are some Aussies talking about this. Uh, check out, ch check them out. I mean, that's how a lot of our listeners have found us is through other people sharing it. So if you want to help us out, look, we appreciate the offers of money. Eventually, we will take those offers probably. In the meantime, if you want to help us, the best way to do it is to spread the word with friends and families. And now that we've got that Podbean account, it's never been easy for you to do that. So please, if you like the show, support it by spreading it with friends and family online, in real life, do whatever you can. And we thank you so much. Everyone who's already started doing that, we know there's a number of you, we thank you so much. We have to wrap this up. We've gone a bit over time. Again, stick around for the live show if you're one of the live listeners. But for the official upload, this is episode 26 of the Australian Roundtable on April 5, 2015. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you at 3 p.m. Brisbane time next week.